good morning everyone and welcome to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, today we're going to open the public hearing process with Senate Bill um, 244. And before we start this morning, I'd like to lay down some ground rules because there's a lot of folks here today that would like to come forward and speak. Um, I've been asked to let you folks know that there's no standing here in the front of the room. Um, if you feel you, you want to be in here, you can definitely line up in the back of the room and uh, we will take you as you sign up on the sheet, hopefully. Um, we have this room for this bill until 1030 and I want to make sure that every single person who has come today and wants to speak has the opportunity to speak and address the committee on this bill. I'm going to ask a couple of things. Number one, if you have written testimony, don't read the testimony. Try to paraphrase it. We are not executing this bill today. So the committee will have ample time to read whatever literature or whatever statements that you make. Um, we'll have time to read them. Second of all, when you get up to speak, don't repeat things that people have already said. If you want to come forward and say, I oppose this bill, that's fine. But again, don't repeat things others have said. We're interested in hearing a variety of opinions. Um, what I'm, I'm going to do something a little different because I know that an amendment is going to be coming forward today, I believe. And so I'm going to give folks the opportunity until Friday afternoon. If you have testimony that you would like to refute that you have heard here today, Please send it to us by Friday. I will ensure that every committee member gets a copy of that and it will be taken up during our deliberations when we exec this bill. Um, I would ask you too to please refrain from uh, using foul language um, and uh, that type of things that it's frowned upon very greatly um, because we're really interested in being respectful and civil to each other and I think that there's a variety of opinions and again I don't want someone to feel that they can't come forward and tell us what they think because they're afraid someone in the back is going to be going to say something or yell out something or address them using bad language so please um, try to be very respectful of each other. Um, also, uh, we usually have a way that we do this. Um, we have the sponsor come forward and the co-sponsor if they're here, and then we'll have the representatives or senators that are here that would like to testify. We've had a number of individuals come forward and ask us if they can please come first because they've got other places that they have to be today. So no disrespect to the state reps that are here, but again, there are folks that are here that need to be other places, so I'm going to be taking them first. Okay, that being said, I'm going to call uh, the prime sponsor forward, Senator David Waters, and please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Senator David Waters, uh, District 4, representing Barrington, Dover, Summersworth, and Rollinsford. And I also want to thank all the members of the public uh, who came today to testify so that we can hear their words as well. Um, Senate Bill 244 calls for the submission of names to the National Incident Criminal Background Check System of New Hampshire people who, by an adjudication of the courts, have been found to be not mentally competent. Um, such individuals by federal law already are prohibited from purchasing a weapon from a licensed uh, gun dealer. As a supporter of Second Amendment rights and of Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution, I submitted this bill after I heard from a lot of people in the Second Amendment community and from gun dealers last spring that this might be the one area that we should address. Uh, the language of the bill reflects close consultation, although not complete agreement, with such groups as the National Rifle Association, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, National Alliance for the Mentally uh, Ill in New Hampshire, the Attorney General's Office, court system, and state firearms and Second Amendment groups. The bill then requires that the name of a person who has been adjudicated as not mentally competent be reported to the NICS background uh, system uh, to ch check <clears throat> to determine eligibility to purchase a firearm. Now, under current law, um, it's someone who chooses not to check that box off on the permit application. If the gun dealer or the state police puts the name in the system, the name is not there and the sale can go forward. 
The bill makes no changes in who currently is eligible to purchase a firearm from a licensed dealer. If it's legal or illegal to do so now, it will be legal or illegal to do so after Senate Bill 244 passes. The only change is that gun dealers and the state police will be able to determine if the application was filled out accurately. The bill also only addresses new purchases. It does not affect any firearm someone may currently own, nor does it permit anyone to take a firearm currently owned. It does not address mental illness issues or treatment uh, for it in any way other than individuals who have been adjudicated as mentally incompetent to stand trial under noted provisions in state statute and for other conditions as well. You'll see there's a definition of adjudication. Uh, this is important that it be clear and that it follow federal law. And there are statutes in state law that follow federal law that are cited. It is only after a court procedure with representation and due process that someone is adjudicated as not mentally competent. The categories then include a person who has been found not competent to stand trial pursuant to RSA 135.17 due to what they call it a mental disease or developmental intellectual disability has been found not guilty by reason of insanity, pursuant to RSA 651-8A, has been appointed a guardian, pursuant to RSA 464-A, or has been involuntarily committed to a mental health facility, pursuant to RSA 135 or RSA 171. I want to note particularly that last category of commitment to a mental health uh, facility. These are involuntary commitments. And in particular, they are after the initial 10-day period during which two hearings have been held. Voluntary commitments or temporary ones to an incident or a medication problem under that 10 days are not included in this legislation. And I think this provision is an important response to the concerns that uh, NAMI New Hampshire and other groups have uh, raised about possible stigmatization or that people might fear getting treatment uh, uh, because of this. And I do want to note in, in that regard that I could find no data to suggest that the 39 other states that report to NICS have had any increased problems in this matter in comparison to states that don't report uh, to NICS. I think the bill also strengthens Second Amendment rights and health privacy rights by ensuring such mental health information is private and by establishing a confidential process for removal of a name from the NICS system. Two federal court rulings have found that reporting to the NICS system does not violate any provision of, the, of HIPAA, and there's been a recent executive order uh, which ensures that HIPAA rights are not violated by the NICS system. The bill establishes a procedure for such a person to have his or name, her name removed from the NICS index after termination of guardianship or by petition three years after the expiration of a commitment order. All documents are confidential, and the hearing is in closed court unless the petitioner requests otherwise. There is also a de novo appeal process for the Superior Court. This is of particular importance to the NRA, and so we put it in the bill. You will also see before you that uh, Senator Clegg and Attorney Evan Knappen have asked for consideration of a, of a possible amendment that would permit persons adjudicated as mentally incompetent to have that record annulled should circumstances warrant. I ask legislative services to prepare a draft amendment so the committee uh, could review um, that issue. I also want to mention that I've heard quite a bit from the disability rights community with some current concerns about the inclusion of uh, disabled individuals uh, in some of these provisions. Um, I think you're going to hear some testimony about that today, and I think that may be something that could rather um, directly be addressed through an amendment to take care of those concerns that you will uh, hear. Well, I mean, obviously any gun legislation, if you've been getting phone calls and emails over the weekend, uh, produces a passionate response. Um, last spring, as we considered gun legislation, I too received dozens of letters from constituents and from people across the state, and I suspect from many people in the room behind me today. And I want to quote from that letter. It told me, your focus should be on strengthening mental health care and improving the quality of data supporting NICS checks. Do not pass more gun laws, instead work to enforce the ones already on the books. Now in the budget, we provided a great deal of new uh, funding for mental health care. So I think this bill does the, the rest of what the Second Amendment uh, supporters wrote me to do uh, last, last spring. Um, the gun owners of, uh, of New Hampshire in particular expressed concerns in the bill 
about the exemption of liability provision, section nine of the bill. Um, I consulted with attorney uh, Rice and it was felt that we could remove that if it was causing concern for a gun owner in New Hampshire, so I prepared an amendment for you to remove uh, that provision. Gun owners in New Hampshire also expressed some con great concern about what would happen if a name were erroneously submitted. And again, I consulted with the Attorney General's office and they said that we do have the capacity in state very quickly to remove uh, some someone's name from the system if in fact it has been submitted uh, erroneously. <coughs> I'll conclude by saying as a Second Amendment supporter, it's my hope the discussion of this bill will be based on facts and on the content of the bill itself. This is a common sense approach, which has substantial support from the firearms community and from those who support public safety. As Foster's uh, Demo Daily Democrat and its lead editorial today supporting uh, this bill says it's a very small step, but something we need to do. Um, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony this morning, Senator. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Picaldo? <coughs> Good morning, Senator Waters. How are you doing? Morning. I'm sure you got phone calls, but they told me they were going to call you after they finished talking to me. <laughs> are, you, are you familiar with the HEPA law itself? Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. So that would be your code of federal regulations? Pardon? That's the code of federal yes. regulations. Okay. Let me uh, excerpt, if I may, Madam Chair, that the 45 CFR Part 160 standards for privacy of individual identification and health information. We all understand, okay, the Second Amendment says thou shalt not infringe. Do you feel this is infringement? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I, if I did, I wouldn't have introduced the bill. And uh, I believe that it's important that Second Amendment rights are a constitutional right, and they should be abridged only with great caution and restored as quickly as possible. We have federal statute that says that folks who have been adjudicated uh, as mentally incompetent, their names should be submitted so they may not purchase a weapon from a licensed uh, firearms dealer. The HIPAA pr provisions on privacy are very important. Um, what is submitted to the Federal Registry simply says that the submission is not because of felon, but because of mental health. No, no records, no details of someone's uh, case of treatment. It's just simply that fact as to why they are going to the system. And I think this is why the federal courts have found that there is no violation of HIPAA um, through the NICS system. Senator Bruton, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Good morning, Senator Morris. Good morning. Uh, question that uh, actually the sort of thread of several issues that uh, uh, surface in all of the emails. The one that uh, interests me a bit, and I thought perhaps you could take a moment to address it. And there's a phrase that continually gets utilized in this, um, in some of the correspondence and it says see a shrink lose your gun uh, and the, the suggestion is that your bill would allow psychiatrists to take away uh, people's government gun without a court order uh, and that furthermore that because of that possibility which I'm not sure that it's uh, I'll listen to your answer but because of that that would discourage people from seeking mental health care. Could you address that? Well, thank you, Senator. And I think it's a very important concern, and that's why I want to reiterate that this bill has no such provision about that. The key word here is adjudicated, that these are individuals who, through a court process, not because some doctor says this or that, um, has been found um, in, in one of these categories. Um, and uh, I do think that there had been some confusion, perhaps, with a bill that was considered in the House that had some of those provisions. And uh, I would not have supported that bill, and I do not support those kinds of provisions. This addresses only those individuals who have been adjudicated. As to the stigma issue, um, as I mentioned, uh, I am very concerned about that. We want people to get treatment and to get help um, when they, they need it, and that's very important, but I think people should feel confident that there's nothing in the bill, in this bill, that affects them. And in particular, let's note that this bill only deals with purchases going forward from licensed dealers. As my testimony says, there is no provision here from removing anyone's weapons or preventing other kinds of, of sales. It is narrowly focused only on those folks who are adjudicated and the issue of 
purchased from a licensed dealer. Yes. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so let, let's be clear then. Um, if someone is going to see a counselor, psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever it might be, uh, because maybe they've had a, uh, uh, a dramatic event in their family, uh, maybe they're down on their luck with their health or work, whatever the issue might be, so you go and see someone to get some counseling. Uh, does that qualify someone to be? Uh, and they don't, there's nothing beyond that. You just go to an office and eat, give you a few times, maybe they give you some medication. Does that qualify for being put on the next list? No, absolutely not. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Are there any other questions from the committee? Senator Tomba. If I may continue, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, Senator Waters, uh, you, you probably received as many emails as I have, maybe even more. But one of them I got was on the Gun Owners of America. And they're talking about the uh, misleading points within the bill. May, may I read one in particular? The Senate Bill 244 does not create disqualifiers. True or false? Um, thank you, Senator, but I'm not sure I understand that. All right, let me, let me continue on what the response back is. There are millions of American gun owners who could potentially lose their gun rights under the ATS expansive interpretation of 18 U.S.C. 922 in parentheses G, and the Next Improvement Act of 2008. Contained within that 27 CFR, 478 uh, point 11 and 27 CFR, 478 colon 32, let's start with everything with Alzheimer's. If you have Alzheimer's, you're gonna lose your guns, according to this. Um, thank you for your question, and let me uh, reiterate, as I, I said to uh, S S Senator Wooten, that this has no effect whatsoever on a condition such as, as Alzheimer's. It has, it, I think it's important to note that we make our laws in New Hampshire. This is a New Hampshire law. You will see those four categories of adjudication in there. That's what this law is, is about. And um, again, I, you know, with family members of, who have various uh, conditions, um, I think it would be inappropriate for such a law to cover those, and this law does not. Can you do a follow-up now? Yes. Do you think it's unconstitutional? Uh, the bill is up. This bill? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, I believe this bill is fully constitutional in that it in fact makes no real change in uh, Second Amendment rights. Um, the Nick's law itself to which we are reporting these names has not been found to be unconstitutional. We are reporting these names as we are authorized to do so under federal federal law so um, and I and I will assure you this bill has been carefully uh, examined by our attorney general's office and by members of the court system and let um, be light <laughs> it goes off when I'm talking I do know <laughs> um, you know I, I took an oath to defend our Constitution and I will do so and I believe this is a constitutional bill thank you are there any further questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much, Senator. Thank you. Uh, the chair will call the co-sponsor, um, Representative Jeff Foley. Good morning, Representative. Could you please identify yourself for the record? Good morning. For the record, my name is Representative Jeff Goley, representing Hillsborough 8, which is Manchester Ward 1. And thank you, Madam Chairman, and good morning for the rest of the committee. Good morning. I will be brief. I know there's a lot of people from the public here waiting to testify uh, on behalf of this legislation. But I wanted to be here to put on the record that I am a gun owner, I'm a hunter, and that I have always, since I've been up here, supported the Stand Your Ground Law and I voted for that here in New Hampshire, as well as put in legislation this year to make sure that these folks behind me that have concealed carry permits, that that information is not put out publicly and is part of the right to know law here in New Hampshire and cannot be public. I think Senator Waters did a great job explaining what this legislation does and why we're here offering it today before the committee. I wasn't going to speak. I just got out of work at 7.30 this morning and uh, went home just in time to print some information, get changed, and get up here for the hearing. Uh, but what drew me to coming out this morning is the number of emails I received and particularly 
the NRA legislative alert that I received at noontime that went out at noontime yesterday. In the legislative alert that the National Rifle Association sent out, there's some good information in there explaining why this bill has come forward, explaining the background of the federal NICS system, and explaining about the annulment process and pe allowing people to get their firearms back in the process in doing that. One of the comments on their sheet says, such restoration of rights provisions included is included in Senate Bill 244. Nowhere in the NRA legislative alert is there a call to action for their members because this is going to take away someone's gun rights. I think what we've seen is there's a small group out there that is misinterpreting and misleading some of these folks behind me about what this legislation is going to do. And what I have full confidence in is those attorneys on a national level at the National Rifle Association that have looked at this legislation. That's all they do. Day in and day out, review legislation that come across states and through the country, checking to see if they're going to remove anyone's gun rights here in the United States and in New Hampshire. Nowhere in here does it say it's going to do that. I would take them, their word, over someone else's word that's passing around misinformation here in New Hampshire about this legislation to rile up this group as to what this legislation truly does. And for that reason, Madam Chair, I'm here today just to submit the legislative alert that, was, uh, hit, that was, I received make sure the committee has it, and just testify for what's that. And thank you, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Representative. I was going to ask you to please make sure to give the uh, committee a copy so that we can see Unfortunately, that. I only had time to print one copy this morning. I didn't get one for everyone. Okay, we can, we can get that for you. Uh, Senator Susie? Thank you, Representative Foley. Uh, just one quick question, and that is, are you a member of any of the gun rights organizations? I am not. Senator Cataldo? Madam Chair, thank you very much. Representative Goley, uh, just a correction, by the way, and you'll understand where I'm coming from because that's just me. Uh, it's not a permit, it's a license. We don't need permission, we have a Second Amendment. Are there any further questions, Senator Booth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Goley, for coming here this morning. Uh, you're a, a farmer. Yes, sir. Uh, and I presume. You also uh, come into close contact with a number of police officers in, in your line. Yes. So the question I have for you, uh, and I think this is probably after the HIPAA issue, this was the second most issue that pre most frequently was raised, and that is, and I quote, uh, or I paraphrase, I should say, uh, that this bill would, uh, is uh, alleged, would permanently disarm policemen, firemen, and veterans with PTSD uh, and would discourage them uh, from veterans with PTSD uh, symptoms from seeking help. So my, I guess what I'm asking is if, if you were to arrive at a uh, an emergency scene and uh, there were some really gut-wrenching things that were happening. Uh, and subsequent to that event, you then went, I assume there's a process within your department, to go see somebody to talk to them, a counselor, some chaplain, whatever, to talk about what you experienced and how it was affecting you. Uh, does that mean after that incident, does that mean that you lose your right to own a gun? Senator, no, that is not true. I think Senator Waters explained that very well, that there are four specific reasons that are listed in this legislation and currently that is part of the system now. What this does is allow adjudication of those instances where someone has had this happen. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Representative.
Um, the chair will call um, the Honorable Robert Clegg and Attorney Evan Knappen, who have asked to come up together. Good morning, gentlemen. Please Good identify morning. yourself for the record. The record, my name is um, Robert Clegg. I'm from Program New Hampshire. Attorney Evan Knappen on behalf of Program New Hampshire. <coughs> Madam Chair, thank you very much to the committee for taking us. Um, we're here in support of Senator Waters' amended version, which is um, amendment number 0069S. And we're here because in it, it has the ability um, for someone who has had mental health. Senator, like, no, we interrupt you. We do not have that. We have the image here? No, we don't have that. Yeah, we have to get it out before you look at it. Sure. Um, <laughs> you may continue. Thank you. Thank you. Having sat in your seat once, um, I know how sometimes it's important not to let things out so that they don't get used. Okay. Um, in it, you will see that there is a section that we asked um, to have put in. Um, with me today is Evan Knappen. Well, he's not the um, so-called biggest pro-gun attorney in the state that you saw in one of the alerts. He is the most prominent and nationally recognized uh, gun rights expert in the country. And he's here today so that he can actually, he can actually, I play a lawyer a lot, but he's actually one. Um, and he can answer your question and explain in detail why it's so important to have that session. Good morning, Mr. Knapp. Good morning. Thank you. Yes, when I first looked at the bill, we saw that there was a uh, relief mechanism that removed the name from the NICS index. That's how the original bill read. Mm -hmm. The problem is that won't really help anyone get relief because the way the procedure works to actually purchase a firearm from a dealer is you first have to fill out a 4473 form for purchase. And in that form, it asks a question as to whether you've ever had uh, one of these mental health uh, commitments. It asks whether you have this disqualifier. <clears throat> if your name's simply been taken off the NICS list, it doesn't remove the disqualifier. So you'd have to still write yes on the form. And if you wrote no, even though your name's not on the list, you'd be lying because you still have that commitment. So what's necessary is an annulment process, just like we have for various criminal offenses. And in fact, the amendment uh, mirrors the criminal annulment so that you could have the same effect of annulment for a mental health record. Now, one of the things that have been put forward, uh, which was discussed about, I just want to add further commentary to it, about the uh, involuntary emergency admissions. What about folks that fall under this, where they're the three-day emergency uh, problem? Well, I think it's important to note that the bill only covers sections uh, 34 to 45. Now that section specifically on uh, uh, 135C, 34 to 35, I mean, uh, it covers non-emergency involuntary admissions. The involuntary admissions is actually part of uh, section uh, 27 through 33. If you note that 135C does not, in, of 27 to 33, is not included as a mental health record that is put forward under this bill. Now let me add two things about that. Even if those records, because the alert that went out by one of the groups said, well, we fear that this may happen. It's our fear that this may happen. If that were to actually happen, two things that apply to emergency admissions. One, if the individual is uh, found after the three days not to need further uh, time in the mental health facility, et cetera, by, by the way, by way of a court adjudication, if that's what's found, there already is an annulment process under that statute for those emergency admissions. And you can immediately, so one area in New Hampshire where there already is a mental health Annulment, the only area for those emergency admissions. 
So there's already a annulment process. Plus, if those records were to go in, even though they're not included in the bill specifically, but even if they were, and even the person chose not to get the annulment, which they're allowed to get under federal case law, Rylander is one of the, and Smith. This is Federal Appeals Court, First Circuit, our jurisdiction. It has been found that those admissions uh, do not cause a federal disqualifier. And that even though the government originally took a position that they did, these two individuals were convicted under that. Their convictions were overturned and declared as such because of Heller, the Heller decision regarding the Second Amendment. And it's Rylander and Smith, those are the two case names for the circuit, and which even if you are and have been subject to one of these emergency missions, even if the record has gone in, and even if you didn't take advantage of your annulment process, which you can do right now without any need for anything to be done by the legislature, it still can't be used against you. And let's say someone is so wrongly denied a firearm purchase, then what you do is you file the Nick's appeal. And as stated earlier, you can even go right here to the gun line and get them to fix it. And if not, you can file it with a, a federal, the dealer gives you a form to file the appeal. So there's absolute recourse if this wrong is done to somebody, okay? Absolute recourse there already. So the idea of this creating a uh, problem for individuals that are otherwise uh, okay and just go through that is not legally true. It just isn't. And the other emphasis here is that this is, if you have a voluntary commitment, that's not a federal disqualifier, that's not a record that goes in. If you go yourself, this is strictly involuntary. And the other key is adjudication. Everything here that's going in involves the court. Now, in those emergency admission procedures, by the way, that can go into uh, other commitments, right, other mental health commitments, you have a right to an attorney through the entire process. And in New Hampshire, if you can't afford an attorney through this entire process, one will be appointed to you. So you have a right to counsel through the entire process that is adjudicated by the courts. That's our system. And that's the records that this bill intends to put in, which would put it in New Hampshire in conformance with the federal national instant check system. Because right now these records aren't in. If the records go in, that's it. We didn't create any new disqualifier. We didn't say, hey, you're now disqualified. No, in fact, if a record goes in there of someone who's not disqualified under federal law, they can immediately challenge it under Nick's appeal, which is why the system's there. Look, every day with criminal records, there are individuals who get denied, where their record was uh, uh, mistakenly put in, where it's not a disqualifier because uh, of that. A Nick's appeal is what resolves it. That's why there's an appeal system in the Nick system for the instant check. If anyone is one of these speculative cases, these hypotheticals that people are saying is a problem here, there's a method to address it. That's the point. It can absolutely be addressed if that were ever to occur. But I don't think it will. But if it does, there's the way to uh, handle it right in law. The flaw in the bill as originally put forward though did not include the annulment process. The amendment here has an annulment process that mirrors what New Hampshire already does for criminal annulments. It will have the effect under the Nixon Improvement Act of being a qualifying annulment. So what this body would be able to do is to say to thousands of individuals that have had mental health commitments that are now federally disqualified under federal law. In other words, these people are prohibited just as felons right now from having a firearm, yet they're perfectly healthy, perfectly sane. They do not have the problem anymore that led to this commitment. There's no way for them to get relief in New Hampshire. You are stuck. You are permanently deprived of your firearm rights. The relief mechanism in here will help all of those people. And it's my understanding there's somebody here today who falls into that direct category that will be talking to you as well as to how that person spent thousands of dollars to try to relieve himself of this disqualifier with a judge ultimately just saying, the law doesn't let me do it, I'm sorry, you're stuck. 
That's what this bill changes. Helps thousands and thousands of otherwise law-abiding folks that should legally be able to own guns be able to do it not just in New Hampshire, nationally. Because remember, if you've had a commitment in New Hampshire, a mental health commitment, and you can't get relief here, that's a federal bar in all 50 states. If this relief mechanism is passed, now the person goes through this procedure where that relief is granted, that person is now lawful under federal law in all 50 states, and of course New Hampshire as well. And right now that cannot be done. So that was the purpose of this amendment to allow that. And by the way, that can't be done with one exception, the emergency one, which we already had an annulment process, which also mirrors the criminal annulment that's already in our law, but only on the emergency one. We need to extend it here to this, and then have the records put in, which as testified to earlier, has been found to be constitutional. It's been found to be, it, NICS itself, the national background check has been found to be that. You know, Heller, Second Amendment decision, McDonald, as it applies to the states, the case law is there, and nothing has taken down the instant check system as unconstitutional. It is constitutional. But more than that, I want you to think a little bit into the future if you don't put these records in. What's the impact of that? Do you really want licensed dealers selling to people who are otherwise federally prohibited? Is that really a good idea? Is it a good idea that somebody who has the disqualifier here under federal law, buys a gun from a dealer. And imagine if there's a problem with that person, with that firearm, the backlash that we're gonna feel on that, that a dealer sold a gun to a person who committed some atrocity. What's gonna happen to that dealer? What's gonna happen to our gun rights? That we did nothing. When there's a federal law that already makes them a disqualifier, and we just said as New Hampshire, well, we're not going to tell you who they are. It's not a good idea. Instead, we put the records in, and then we provide the mechanism for those that are not a problem to be able to get their rights back throughout the entire United States. They get their rights back, which they cannot do now. That's why we have pro-gun New Hampshire support this bill. Any thank you very much. Senator Lasky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, gentlemen, and thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned an attorney guarantee. Is there an attorney guarantee throughout the annulment process? I'm sorry, an attorney guarantee? Yeah. Yes. Oh, 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 that I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know about that. But there is, attorneys are guaranteed throughout the commitment process. This is what you but said. I, it, I'm asking. But I don't, I, that's not something I'm, a, I'm aware of in here. Is that because the same as if in criminal, if I may, I'll just say, oh. if, you're, if you're convicted of a crime or charged with a crime, you can't afford an attorney. One is appointed to you throughout the process. But when it comes, if you want to get rid of your criminal record, assuming you have one, mm -hmm. there's no attorney appointed for that. So I would doubt that there would be in this case. It's the due process of the uh, commitment itself, just like a prosecution, arguably, it's similar. Thank you. Yes. Senator Cataldo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tony Knappen, how are you doing? Hi there. And Honorable Craig. Mike, how are you doing today? Uh, one of the things, I'm reading your amendment here, and uh, it talks about a petition that the court documents are going to be confidential. And again, the question that came up earlier from my colleague here is that the annulment costs. The things that I've been reading that the costs are going to be astronomical. Can we verify whether that's true or not? Well, I can tell you that, uh, I, what, do you, what do you mean by astronomical? What figure are you talking 18, about? 18, 20,000. Oh, great. no. Um, currently, I charge approximately $1,000 to do an annulment. That's, the, that's what it runs. If some other attorney is charging 10 or 20 times that, uh, I don't know about it, but it runs about 1000 bucks, And that way you get annulment. I've also, in other jurisdictions as well, I, I, where I can do mental health annulments, where they already have it, they call it expungement. Same thing. So I suspect it will be somewhere in that range for actually clearing your record. Not to put you on the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you would do it to nothing to me then? No problem. If I may, Senator, there are, <laughs> there are attorneys who, who um, don't mind charging ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars and 
there's not much you can do. There are cases where the courts have actually admonished attorneys for overcharging their clients, but um, it, once once the word gets out that Evan does them for a thousand dollars, I'm sure it'd be. Yeah, currently, right now, yeah, if you would call the other, say that's what it would be. It'd be a thousand bucks, and then there's three hundred dollars in filing fees, out of pocket fees. That's the total cost, and I do it as a flat fee, as a matter of fact. <coughs> So now you know my actual fee that I charge. There you go. That's what it is. Yeah, for a criminal. Thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for coming here this morning. Uh, I would like, uh, Attorney Knappen, if you could focus on this notion that this bill uh, strips um, folks uh, to process constitutional rights. Uh, can you address that? Is, do you see that happening? In this mm -hmm. Not all, all, all the bill does is put records in that exist. Uh, the due process as to how that commitment got placed in the first place runs through the system that we currently have, whether it's counsel and judges making decisions. So due process is given to that individual throughout that process and all this bill does is put records in that that commitment occurred. So I don't see that. And if in fact a person uh, is wrongly placed in the database, then there's recourse here to have it removed if it's a mistake, or to have it removed if it's true by way of annulment. So I don't I don't see a, the due process argument on this bill because it doesn't create new disqualifiers. Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether or not you have uh, in the past or currently represented any veterans. Uh, there seems to be a <coughs> heavy emphasis in uh, the uh, comments that we're receiving that uh, as a matter of fact, I had a, a phone call yesterday, a Vietnam veteran with post-traumatic stress syndrome and uh, actually diagnosed with that going to the VA for treatment and so forth. And his, his concern was that if this bill passes, uh, we're going to take his gun with it. Well, he's, he hasn't had a commitment, right? And it's also, there's federal, he's in the federal prohibitor under the federal system with the VA. These are New Hampshire state records. This is New Hampshire state. Why is any, did he have a New Hampshire state commitment? If he had a New Hampshire state commitment based on his post-traumatic stress, then this bill finally will allow him to get his rights back because he's currently a disqualified person and this will allow him to do it. If he hasn't gotten into the state records, because New Hampshire can only do it within its own jurisdiction of the state, this bill can only help him to the degree that it's state records. If it's got a federal problem, he's going to have to go through the federal relief system for the veterans. But if it translated in any way here, then he would be able to take advantage of this and maybe be able to help him too, which would be nice. This doesn't cause him any further problems. This, this, this bill actually provides him with an ability to possibly get relief. Senator, let me, let me expand on what he said. We're, we're working with somebody now who is a, an active duty veteran who came home after three tours in Afghanistan and decided he needed to see um, someone to help him out. And his mother told the local police chief that he was getting some assistance, and the local chief removed his um, concealed carry. And after he was done getting his help, he um, went back and his doctor wrote a note and the local chief decided that since he had seen someone for help, he wasn't entitled to a, a concealed carry. I'm giving you a very brief, it goes on and on and on. Um, it's so bad that this gentleman has asked to be reassigned overseas where um, foreigners seem to have a better respect for our active duty veterans. Uh, so this bill would help him too because if somebody's going to claim that he was involuntarily or however committed um, right now he has nothing he can do to go back and try to reclaim his uh, his rights other than to leave the country so it is happening and there's nothing in there as you will hear from someone else that allows you um, to get your rights back 
currents. So, yes. So in, in the uh, incident that you just described, this mm -hmm. bill would help this individual. Anytime someone has been reported that um, they have a mental condition and shouldn't have um, the use of weapons, then this would allow them, in my opinion, to go before court and get that um, overturned. And, and there are a number of people, remember, we call it mental health disease, and all diseases uh, can be treated, and when they're treated, most people are as normal as, as the rest of us. And so, um, right now, there's no way that they can prove normalcy. They can bring all the doctors they want, and the judge is gonna throw his hands up and say, there is no law that allows me to do what is necessary. Okay, one last question. Yes. Um, Attorney now, I'd like to direct this to you. Uh, it is um, suggested that uh, as a mere uh, statement by a psychiatrist would be, under this bill, would be sufficient enough to exclude, uh, to, to have your name put on the mix list and therefore uh, impair your uh, right. Uh, how does that square up with the idea that, at least as I understand it, that the thrust of this bill has to do with involuntary commitments? That, that is just an abs absolutely not true. I and mean, let's take what you just said. The psychiatrist says that uh, you are what? Uh, what's the psychiatrist going to say? What is in your question that the psychiatrist says? Uh, they what? Well, they, are, they shouldn't have guns? Well, the, 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 it's suggested that the psychiatrist could uh, be the cause for someone to lose their... Okay. With, without actually being committed to a mental health institution. So, well, so you're just going to a psychiatrist for treatment. You may be getting medication, but you're not actually housing mental health. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, you can voluntarily go to a state mental health facility, the same facility where the involuntary person was sent. But if you went there voluntary to get treatment, you're not prohibited under federal law and your record is not being reported under this. No less than you talk to a psychiatrist privately in his office. None of that is part of this bill. It just isn't. Before we go further, Doctor, would you like to come forward? Because we've got these questions about um, how what happens, and you are a psychiatrist, so please come forward and okay, just identify you. yourself for the record, and perhaps um, you can answer some of these questions. I'll do the best I can, Senator. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are you? No. Did I speak? Yes. Speak Please identify yourself for the record. And I apologize for jumping out of context here, but because the committee has a lot of questions, we received a lot of statements in the emails that we had gotten that um, there were many people that feared that psychiatrists were going to be taking away people's gun rights if you went to see a psychiatrist for a problem or a psychologist. So while that question is out there, the doctor's here, um, he's going to identify himself, um, and he will be able to answer those questions. Doctor, would you please identify yourself for the record? Thank you, Senator. For the record, my name is Dr. Alexander Denesnero. My last name is in two words, a small D-E, then it's based on a capital N-E-S-N-E-R-A. Um, I'm the Associate Medical Director at New Hampshire Hospital, and also um, on faculty at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Um, what question would you like me to answer? Okay, well, thank you very much, Doctor, for, for being here this morning. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard that we've received a lot of emails from constituents who are very concerned that if they go to see a psychiatrist um, seeking help for some particular issue, under this piece of legislation, they are going to lose their, they're going to lose their gun rights. And it's not only a psychiatrist. If someone goes to any kind of mental health counselor, they're going to lose their gun rights. Could you address that question, please? Sure, I'd be glad to. 
So um, the way um, I see uh, this bill being written, it really addresses uh, individuals that are um, committed on an involuntary uh, commitment to New Hampshire Hospital. So just to, to backtrack a little bit to, to um, point out how the process works briefly, when a person is sent on an involuntary emergency admission to uh, New Hampshire Hospital, uh, they are um, admitted and they have to have a hearing within three business days to determine whether in fact uh, the initial involuntary emergency admission was warranted. So they go in front of a district court judge. Uh, if in fact probable cause is found, then um, over a 10-day period, there's further evaluations to determine whether the person would warrant a longer-term commitment to New Hampshire Hospital. And at that point in time, um, if it's felt that the person needs longer-term uh, commitment to the hospital, then a probate petition will be filed. And that's what this bill talks about regarding individuals that would need to um, register in some way. It's those individuals that are committed on what's called in, in, the, uh, uh, in the law a non-emergency involuntary admission. These are individuals that are, that are committed for a period of anywhere up to five years. <coughs> and and uh, this bill addresses just those individuals. Um, it does not at all talk about any other individual <coughs> that goes to see a mental health provider or a counselor or a psychiatrist voluntarily in, um, for treatment. So, so the, the individual that is being treated by a psychiatrist as an outpatient, um, getting therapy, uh, getting medications for a variety of different illnesses would not fall under this law. It's, uh, as far as I can tell and read, it's the individuals that are committed to New Hampshire Hospital on a non-emergency and voluntary admission. Um, regarding the annulment, I just wanted to, 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 to address that issue also. Um, I was involved in that legislation in, in working on um, the annulment of an individual that initially came in on an IEA. And the, the, the statute the way it's written is uh, the, the involuntary emergency admission is annulled if no probable cause is found by the district court judge. Then that particular IEA, Voluntary Emergency Admission, is a no. So I just wanted to address that. Um, and that was, uh, that was I put in and worked with you and others to, to put that in, so that in the future, if there was uh, an individual that came in in, in, in in psychiatric distress and was sent on an involuntary emergency admission, it, it actually, before that legislation was passed, um, precluded them from serving in the armed services, for example. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, that's hopefully answers your question. But I have, I'll be happy to answer many others, and I do have some points that I'd like to point out, if I may, regarding the, the bill the way it's written. Okay. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure that we all understood that someone who just routinely goes to, uh, whether it's a psychiatrist or any kind of therapist, they are not in danger of having their gun rights taken away. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. The short answer. The short answer. Okay. Because as I said, a, a, That's a huge the fear. bulk of the emails that we received were from people who were very, very concerned that if for whatever reason I choose to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a therapist that my name is going to get submitted onto the NICS list and they're going to come and take away my gun. <coughs> so it's good to hear from someone who's a psychiatrist in the field is, who's telling us that cannot happen. Correct. That's, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the committee? If I may. Sure. If, just to follow up. Dr. Vanessa, if a situation were to happen, where somebody voluntarily seeks your treatment and is obtaining treatment, if you were to communicate outside of that relationship, what would be the consequences to you? Pretty dire for me. Um, I think that you know there's a there's a doctor-patient relationship, and um, 
we really, what's discussed and, and the treatment that's discussed uh, is within the confines of that relationship. And so it really is not um, appropriate for the physician to really discuss the treatment with anybody unless the patient specifically allows that to, um, to occur. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor, you had said there were a couple of more points that you would like to make. Would you please do that at this sure, time? Sure, thank you, Senator. So um, I just wanted to uh, point out in, um, let's see, this is uh, Roman numeral two of the bill. Um, it states that uh, the melt uh, at some point when uh, when the the individual is petitioning to have um, the uh, criminal record of, of annulled, uh, it states that the provider would need to uh, present a report to the court and also express opinions relevant to the issue of the likelihood that the petitioner will misuse firearms or otherwise act in a manner dangerous to public safety. I think that's exceedingly difficult for, for anybody to really state. Um, physicians are asked to treat patients um, and we're asked for opinions a variety of times. But I'm not really sure that physicians really would be able to, in full confidence, express opinions relative to the likelihood that the petitioner will misuse firearms in the future. So I think that's a problematic statement. I do, however, believe that if the court wants a report as to, and, and I guess the issue is, does the patient allow it, um, if the court would want a report as to how the um, individual is doing in treatment, whether they're adherent to treatment, then that's that's important information for the court to have. But to, to, to take that and, and, and make the next step as to whether they can effectively use firearms, I think it's difficult. That, that, that's the point. Senator Lasky. Thank you, Madam. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. Um, when one is involuntarily committed in Obviously, you know, your uh, recommendation or a psychiatrist's uh, recommendation is crucial, I believe, in that. Um, would you say that a general criteria would be that um, the patient is incompetent to, you know, go about his, his or her daily business, etc.? I mean, how how is that evaluation sort of uh, generally uh, founded? Senator, that's an excellent question, uh, and, and it brings it brings forth the, the, the concept of um, commitment and competency being two different things. So, when a person is committed to New Hampshire Hospital, uh, the, the statute clearly states that it's due to being a danger to themselves or others as a result of mental illness, and and. That is the criterion that we have, that the state has to show to the probate court uh, that allows for a longer term commitment to New Hampshire Hospital. And by the way, as an aside, a commitment to New Hampshire Hospital does not equate with treatment. Involuntarily hospitalized patients have the right to refuse treatment, but that's another issue. Um, but it has nothing to do with competency. Um, competency is is a uh, is a legal finding based on a person's inability to um, appreciate that they have a mental illness and effectively um, work with the psychiatrist in, in getting the treatment that they deserve. So a finding of a long-term commitment or finding of a commitment to New Hampshire Hospital is just based on being a danger to themselves or others as a result of mental illness. It does not have anything to do with competency. Uh, and, and so I'll stop there. Oh, no, okay, let me follow up. My, I guess my point was your concern about, and, and I uh, understand that concern about having to state, as it, as it uh, says in the statute here, um, about whether a person would misuse firearms. But certainly, in my mind, if you're a danger 
to someone, then it's not a big leap to say you should not have, you know, use of a firearm. So I think it's implied, in other words, by this criteria, in my mind, then, that if you're a danger, this may not have to be in statute as you're suggesting, but that it also is the same implication that you should not have use of a firearm. Well, um, dangerousness has different, um, different levels. Um, when someone says that they're a danger, it could be a danger to themselves as well as others. So, um, you know, where do you, where do you draw the line? That's, that's a difficult line to draw. And that's why it's, it would be difficult for clinicians to really state with certainty that the person would not misuse firearms because there are, um, it, it's really not possible to really predict in the future whether a person's going to be safely using firearms or not. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Gentlemen, thank you very much. Do you, did you have some other points that you wanted to make, Doctor? Uh, no, Senator, sir. Now, no. <laughs> thank you so much right, for uh, you. asking me to give you your, give me my opinion. Thank you. And gentlemen, thank you very much for your thank testimony you. here this morning. Um, the chair will call um, the Honorable Jen Coffey and Susan Olson, who have asked to come up together. Yes, ma'am? Yes, uh, there are several people standing in the hallway, and this does not strike me as a public hearing. I was told I could not begin um, until people left. Is it possible to move this hearing to a larger venue? Not at this point, ma'am. We can't. Uh, this, is the, this is the largest room that the Senate has available to them. I understand. However, there are people who want to hear this hearing and want to be heard at this hearing. Well, and they're not being, uh, they're standing in the hallway. Well, they're welcome to come in and stand up against the back the wall. The person maintaining the door is saying that we cannot come in until people leave. Okay, well, um, we, can, we can try to. The room is at capacity, the room, the room is at capacity ma'am. So is this not a public hearing? Um, I would disagree with you. Um, this is a public hearing, and just as people come in and out, others will, will can come in. We are going to take everyone's testimony this morning, so everyone that's here who wants to testify has the ability to come forward and testify. Okay. She's testifying for somebody else. No, no, Susan. Yes, testifying for somebody else. Okay. Uh, please uh, go ahead and identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm a member of the committee. For the record, my name is Jen Coffey. I'm the National Director of Legislative Affairs for the Second Amendment Sisters, a national organization with thousands of members across the United States, one of our largest being in the state of New Hampshire. And there are many women who enjoy the firearm sports as well as, more importantly, their Second Amendment rights. I'm not going to read to you my testimony that I have submitted. We have a number of concerns with this bill. Um, and we are also confused with some of the terminology that's been thrown around this morning. The bill itself, which is all I can privy to speak to, there's a three-page amendment, but my understanding is that's dealing with annulments and not the rest of this. Um, for example, if you look at the bill under Section 1D, it refers to involuntary commitment to a mental health facility pursuant to RSA 135C3445 and RSA 171B. You've been told that that does not include emergency IEAs. Unfortunately, that is not true. If you look at the language in 135C34, it specifically states involuntary treatment standards. The standard to be used by a court or a physician or a psychiatrist in determining a person should be admitted to a receiving facility for treatment on an involuntary basis. I have worked in medicine for 18 years. In 18 years, I've treated five gunshot wounds, one with suicide attempt. In 18 years, I have treated countless suicide attempts, which I would dare to guess 98% involved over-the-counter prescription, over-the-counter medications that are not prescribed. But we're putting the emphasis on this involuntary object. An involuntary EIA can be done by a physician without a person being seen by a mental health clinician. I have witnessed it on multiple occasions. I'll give you a good example. 
guy comes back from overseas, his third tour, and finds out his wife has not been faithful. He calls his buddies, they take them to the local bar, and he gets drunk. And they get a little rowdy. So the cops show up. And in his drunken stupor, because he's just gone through hell and come home to more hell, is, I don't want to live. Just kill me. Just shoot me now. I'm done. I've seen that more times than not in the ER, which immediately leads to an IEA. That person is now being held by the medical staff. They cannot leave the facility. They cannot refuse treatment. If they attempt to, they will be put into leather restraints. They will be <coughs> examined. If it's determined that physically there's nothing wrong with them outside of the fact that they're inebriated, they are then put into protective custody or whatever language you'd like to use go off with the PC to become sober. They come back the next day, they're checked. <coughs> as long as they are no longer under the influence of drugs or alcohol, now a mental health clinician will see them. If they think there might be some validity to the fact that this person may be suicidal, they will then put in a bed for a New Hampshire hospital. That could be instant, that could take a week. And they'll sit in the ER until that bed's available. I've seen people sit in the ER for three to four to five days under an IEA, stripped of all their rights, go to, to New Hampshire Hospital, and they're out the next day. They're no longer a danger. But this bill includes them, because the law specifically includes them. It's repeated again. This bill also points to one, uh, 135C39, which specifically refers to IEAs and protective custody, which is included in this bill. We at the Second Amendment Sisters obviously are not endorsing that someone who has been shown that they are homicidal, suicidal, we want them to get help, absolutely. Give them the correct help. But put them in a facility where they're gonna get that help. Why is it not okay for this person to have a firearm, this one inanimate object, but they can drive a car into a building, which has been done numerous times and numerously reported. They can drive themselves over an embankment into oncoming traffic in an attempt to commit suicide, taking others out in that process. We haven't taken that away from them. What happened? We need to put the emphasis on mental health correctly. And my understanding is there is a bill in the New Hampshire House that would allow for people who have lost their rights to be able to get those annulments and to be able to get their rights back at the appropriate time, dealing with that issue separately and not together. Another interesting thing about this is that you look at this bill and there's a section in which, section three, the petitioner, it talks about what the petitioner and law enforcement and what they have to do. Well, it says right here in writing that the court can accept a petition in writing, but the person who is being about to be stripped of all of their rights, whose life is hanging in the balance, doesn't get to see their accuser or talk to in front of their accuser because in, in this bill, in that section, it says that they're allowed to submit it in writing. So you don't get that defense. You don't get that ability. It also doesn't do anything to help you for filling out the federal 4473 form that's been mentioned to you already. The petitioner's mental health records and criminal health and criminal records are, are glommed together in section B. We have now said mental health and criminality are the same. <laughs> And we can go back into your records as far as we need to. There is no limitation on this. So if at the age of five, I was an EMT on a scene of a, a crime, a scene of an accident, a drunk driver hit somebody going the wrong direction, and I had a seven-year-old boy trapped in the back seat with his dead sister's body laid across him and his mother and father dead in the front. It took over an hour to get him out of that vehicle. Do you think he needed some help? God, I hope he got it. Being on the emergency end, you don't get to see the follow through. But should we have the right to go back and look at that kid's childhood record and say, 
well, you don't qualify because this bill says we can look at the petitioner's mental health history with no limitation. This bill also says that we, it, it just try to offer some relief. And, and I'll give them, I'll give you, I absolutely give you credit for trying to find some relief. However, when does that happen? An IEA gets into the system and onto the records within 24 to 48 hours before that process starts to go through. I've seen, like I said, patients sitting in the ER for a week waiting to actually be taken over to New Hampshire Hospital. Meanwhile, this paperwork is there and has now been filed and they have been involuntarily emergency held and they have been not, and I don't, I don't know what happens at New Hampshire Hospital where it was stated that people can refuse care in the ER. If you are deemed incompetent, you cannot refuse care. If you are drunk, you cannot refuse care. I know there's a lot of people behind me that, that want to speak. Um, I would at, like to ask the chair that there are four, there's, there's th one three page amendment, one short amendment. I don't know if it's possible for you to have those placed online so the public can see them because they are such major overrides that we are essentially looking at two separate bills. And I would honestly say to you that when I served in the legislature, I, t I learned two things. One was never try to make a bad bill better. I worked really hard one year on, in transportation on a bill for over a year, <coughs> trying to make this bill work. And no matter how hard I worked, I found out there were more errors. This bill has got at least five specific errors that we've noted in our written testimony that we have found. And, and, I, I, and I will say something. Um, the co-sponsor, you know, I'm, I'm great, he's a gun owner, great, he's a hunter. Second Amendment isn't about hunting. It's not about shooting sports. It was put in by our founders to protect us from a tyrannical government. So it's all well and good if you want to hold a firearm and you go hunting, that's great. We in the Second Amendment sisters believe that self-defense is a basic human right. And that's what we're here to stand up for. I will stop there. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you. Are there any questions, Senator Lass? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Representative. Um, <coughs> I just want to make sure, and, and I appreciate for your concerns and, and your good concerns. I just want to make sure I understand. In the scenarios that you uh, testified to, the involuntary commitment and being in the hospital and all, it's my understanding that unless it, uh, the patient or the person is adjudicated, in other words, brought before a judge and probate or whatever court, that does not preclude him or that would not put him on this NICS list. Not is, is that correct? The way this bill is written, it specifically refers to people who have IEAs, which are involuntary commitments. It does not once within this original bill use the word adjudicated, and there is a huge difference between the two. Adjudicated is somebody who's been seen by a mental health clinician, they've been afforded uh, defense, they've been afforded a chance to stand up for themselves. And that's what adjudicated is. An IEA can happen by an emergency room physician who is an emergency room physician, not a psychiatrist, not a mental health clinician. And if, I, if I may Thank just you. follow up with that. Um, representative, if, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm so used to calling the representative. If you look at the amendment on line 21, it does speak to adjudication. So I think this amendment um, addresses a lot of your concerns. But again, this is going to be made available to the public. And as I said at the beginning of the public hearing process, we're going to continue to take testimony. So if there's things that have come forward and people want to offer additional comments, they want a little time to look at this amendment, um, we're going to keep taking uh, your emails and whatever testimony that you want to bring forward. I, so I would appreciate your comments when you when you have time to look at this. I would definitely <coughs> ask the committee to please review 135C34, mm -hmm. 135C39, because though on the surface it may appear, if you see the word adjudicated, if either of those statutes are, are within this new amended version, um, you're still catching your ideas. <coughs> you're still catching those individuals who may have not really 
You know, it, it's like uh, Senator Newton brought up earlier. He was right. You're correct. See a shrink, you run the risk. If I go into my shrink and say, God, the world is closing in on, I'm a cancer survivor right now. I'm facing my next week's surgery. If I walked into my today and said, I'm so depressed about this surgery. I don't even want to go through it. I, I don't want to deal with it. I, I just want to die. Right there, under New Hampshire law, he is responsible. He has a duty to report that I have made that statement. Whether it was just in a state of panic, whether it was just in a state of fear, once you say anything that is, I want to hurt myself or I want to hurt somebody else, you have to report it. And that is also included in the EMS codes that I have to follow as an EMT. They're the same. I hope that helps. Uh, Senator Lansky, did you have an additional question? No, I'm <laughs> Senator Cataldo. Honorable Jen Coffey, thank you for being here today. I'll try to make it quick and brief. Will this bill have helped Connecticut in what happened down there at that school? Absolutely not. There's nothing that we can do as legislators, and we know this, and we compound it year after year with more and more laws that we add to the books. There is nothing that we can do to stop somebody bent on doing harm. We can create all the laws in the books. You and I, the law abiding, will follow them. But somebody who's bent on committing mayhem will. Just like the man who drove his truck into Ruby's Cafe and ran over a ton of people before he decided to then get out and start shooting people. <coughs> or just like the woman who found out her husband's cheating on her and decided to drive over him repetitively on, with their vehicle, which was captured on videotape and many of us may remember seeing her driving. The, they showed her car going around and you could tell the car had a lump at a certain point and then we were later told it was her husband that was underneath the wheels of that vehicle. So if somebody's bent on doing something, I don't see how we could, unless we got the thought police, we can start reading minds, I don't know. In fact, that bi this bill actually requires judges to be um, superior and be able to uh, read minds and see the future. And I actually did not bring that up to you, but I probably should, because you should definitely look at that. If you go to um, section six, it literally makes the court liable to be the thought police. What do I think this person might do down the road? So that's also in this bill. Quite frankly, personally, there is at least five, if not more, issues with this thing. It's a, it, yes, we want to treat mental health patients, absolutely. But we need to do it the right way. There's a bill over there that's a standalone that's, that's all about annulment. Let's do it that way. Let's strengthen our mental health, the state. But passing a bad bill or trying to fix something that is so wrought with errors, I think that there are bigger issues you can be dealing with and better ways that you can be dealing with mental health than trying to spend hours on doing the errors. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple of representatives that need to scoot out of here really quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and call Representative Baldessaro. Um, okay. Please keep your comments very quickly. Don't repeat testimony of her. Don't read anything. Um, identify yourself for the record. For the record, I'm uh, Representative Al Baldessaro, Rockingham County, District 5. I've um, been sitting on the Veterans Affairs Committee for over seven years here in the state. Now, I don't support the bill for a few reasons. Number one, is when I was a Marine of 22 years, when we got a lot of us got sick in Desert Storm from being in Kuwait and other areas, we went for this treatment. All of a sudden they started saying, well, we're gonna start discharging you because you have this sickness. Many of us walked away. We didn't bother going. A lot more who did walk away from it and waited until I retired to go uh, secure treatment for the mental uh, issues that I had from Desert Storm. I see this bill as something doing the same thing here. Here in New Hampshire, we have probably anywhere from 450 to 600 homeless veterans, many of Vietnam veterans. We have probably um, uh, anywhere from 130, 135,000 veterans in the state. There are many cases of PTSD. There are two areas in the bill which I have a concern. One of them is under line 13, page, the second page, where it says, he has been appointed a guardian person uh, pursuant to RSA 464-8. 
many veterans that are homeless that are in the system, some of them, uh, quite a few have guardians appointed to them to help them with their finances and also have PTSD. Does that mean they gotta kill themselves? No, it doesn't. Um, the same thing with the, um, the next line there on the D, has involuntarily committed to a mental health facility. New Hampshire does not have a facility for veterans with mental health issues. We have the bed space in Maine or in Massachusetts. And we have quite a few that are in the system waiting to be involuntary for bed space to come forward. Now my concern is, does this open the door up for veterans here in the state that are gonna say, okay, well, hey, this guy is being committed there. He should be going through the system here in New Hampshire. Okay, for that word to get out. I have some concerns there. Another area that I have concerns are is this bill goes after low-income and middle-class people. They had a lawyer come up here and say that it costs you a thousand dollars to get this straightened annulment and other stuff. Many of the low-income veterans, even police, young policemen have been in a, in a shootout that have to go for this volunteer uh, treatment and other stuff there. I've been helping some firemen through the VA system here with some issues, okay, that are veterans but they're firemen that this could really put, knock them out of, uh, lose their rights. Now, when they get caught up in the systems through the NICs, what that means is they, they don't know the legal system. They don't know how to get their stuff up. They could be losing their rights for the rest of their life. Are we trying to fix something that's not broken? If you look at the statics, uh, the, the numbers in 2011, because I don't have the numbers in 2012, you had about 12,664 murders throughout the state. Out of those murders, 496 throughout the country were with hammers. 1,694 were with knives. 728 were with f fist and feet. Rifles were used 323 times. So what I'm asking you here, is this bill fixing something that really is not broke? Are we assuming could be might be because of what happened in Connecticut? In this bill, Senator um, Catala, you answered it, and the representative before me, said it wouldn't have nothing to do with it. So I'm asking you, let's, let's try to come up with a better plan to go after the criminal, or maybe strengthen our mental health issues. Not put them away and take their rights away. That's all I have, and I'm just any questions. Thank you very much, Representative. Are there any questions for the committee? <coughs> Seeing none, thank, thank you. you. Um, the Chair will call Representative John Burke, and Representative Burke, I'm gonna say the same things to you. Um, there are a lot of folks here willing to testify, and. If you could please uh, keep your comments within a possibly two minute limit, that would be terrific. Please identify yourself for the record. For the record, um, thank you, Madam Chair, fine committee members. Uh, for the record, I am Representative John Burt, and that's B U R T, and I represent Goffs County. <coughs> so I would just like to point out that the burden <coughs> should be always on the state, not the individual. That is the way our founding fathers intended it. I believe this bill will put the burden on the individual. They'll have to prove their innocence until uh, they're going to be guilty until proven innocent. You know, right from the get-go, we have a due process that would take care of most of this, or I believe all of it. Uh, I'll be real brief on this: is that this bill before you? is really the start of what Australia and England have gone through. Currently, they are disarmed. Their legal citizens are disarmed. They're law-abiding citizens. This bill will lead to that. I have no doubt in my mind. Australia and England have seen crime rates skyrocket. Over the next 40 years, Madam Chair and fine committee members, at least the next 40 years, because time to these people that want to do this is nothing. They'll set the stage, and over the next 40 years, remember in the late 90s and early 2000s, in our schools, we used to have basically gumball machines full of, you know, the uh, Ritalin for ADHD kids. You know, they used to pop it by, you know, just like candy, like M&M's. What will happen is in 20 years, this bill will be back many, many times, and they will include those kids that are now adults that were on this Ritalin 
with the ADHD. And they'll say, you know, they could be a little imbalanced. We better make sure that, you know, we evaluate them. And then Al Baldessero said, the vets, I won't touch on that. I myself went through a extremely nasty divorce in 2002. Lasted two and a half years. <clears throat> Many people said I shouldn't say this in front of, you know, on the record, but bottom line, the NSA already has the record, I'm sure. So anytime you want to know, just call them, they'll let you know. In that process, I went because it was a nasty divorce. I needed help. And you know what? The lady was great. She helped me. She put me on the right track. I moved from Woodsville, New Hampshire to Goffstown, New Hampshire, met my current wife. I am extremely lucky. I am now a state representative, a business owner, and it was all because I feel, partly because I went and saw a therapist and got help. This bill passes, I'll tell you right now, I'll never go see another therapist. I'm scared to death to go see one now. And it disturbs me that I saw, when I saw the sheet of supporters on this bill, it just shocks me the names I saw in there. And I believe most of the names are there because of money. They're paid to be here to testify in favor of this bill. It, again, I'm very shocked. I just want to show you this too. I know you're not supposed to have props, but this is the Constitution of the United States. I believe we shouldn't even have a, a, a license to carry a concealed permit because in here it doesn't say that I have to go beg the selectmen. This bill is extremely dangerous. And to finish up, to show my point about Australia, England being disarmed, the ADHD, you know, my divorce, and etc. Why I feel these are so important topics, and I want you really, really to look at this is because the co-sponsor, he said it. He said it with one word. The second he said it, I jumped up and down inside. I said, thank you, co-sponsor of this bill. Thank you. The fine representative from Manchester asked him a question. You see a lot of bad things as a fireman. Could you lose your gun rights? He responded with, Currently, no. You know what that means? Currently? That means today, no. This bill will not do it. But currently means this bill will be back to add the children that took ADHD, the vets, in my divorce. They have 40, 50 years. They don't care how long it will take. This will set the stage. They will come back and come back and come back. So, Senator, I appreciate that question because when he said currently no, it says everything right there. Currently no means it will be back. Madam Chair, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Representative. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. The Chair will call Ann Rice. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ann Rice. I'm the Deputy Attorney General and I appear on behalf of, the, on behalf of the Attorney General in support of this bill. Um, Senator Waters and Attorney Mappa really did an excellent job of sort of walking through what the bill has, so I'm going to not do that. I'd like to just address some points that have been brought up in the testimony since then. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. DeMezra pointed to the issue of what had uh, the standard that had to be shown in order for a person to get relief under the gun law, which is at, um, I'm looking at the amendment, and it would be page 2, lines 27 to 30. That language is drawn directly from the federal law. If the, feder the federal law will recognize gun relief if it meets particular standards. And so that language was included specifically because it satisfied the federal guidelines for relief. Um, and I realize that there's some difficulties with that, 
But if if we don't have relief that qualifies under the federal law, federal law won't recognize it. So I think it's important to, to have that in there. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about what these four categories are. The people that would be, would fall within um, the group that whose names would go to next. First one is not competent to stand trial. That is a finding by a superior district court. When someone has been charged with a criminal offense, the person is entitled to counsel. There is a full hearing on it. There is an evaluation that is done. And what it means is that the person, because of mental disease, is not able to rationally consult with and understand the proceedings against him or her. So there's full due process in that um, when someone has been found <coughs> not competent to stand trial. Not guilty by reason of insanity. That means that a person has been charged with a criminal offense and has either gone through a trial and the jury has found a person that was not guilty by reason of insanity, or in the vast majority of cases in New Hampshire, the prosecutor has agreed to allow someone to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Based on my knowledge, no one has ever pled and been found not guilty by reason of insanity by a jury. The only time that has happened is when, uh, particularly in homicide cases, where the prosecutor recognizes that the person would sustain their burden and that they were clearly insane at the time of their offense. So there's a full due process um, procedure before someone is found not guilty by reason of insanity. C, appointed by a guardian. That is a probate court proceeding. There has to be a petition filed. The probate court has to make particular findings. Uh, the person for whom the petition has been filed is entitled to representation by counsel, and an indigent can uh, have counsel appointed for them. Again, there's a full proceeding before someone has been appointed a guardian. And finally, the involuntary commitment. There is clearly a misunderstanding about what this covers. This does cover involuntary commitments. It does not cover emergency involuntary commitments, which is the process that um, Ms. Coffey was ref uh, referring to. The, a non-emergency non involuntary commitment only happens when a petition has been filed and a district court, excuse me, probate court makes a specific finding that the person needs to be involuntarily committed. Excuse me, could you please speak into the microphone because there's a behind you that can't, can't hear. Me. Sure. Is that better? Is that better? Uh, is that any better? Um, yes. yes. Okay. I apologize. So it is, um, I just want to make clear, is involuntary commitments are covered, but it is only non-emergency involuntary commitments because those are the process where there is a full hearing before the probate court, uh, appointment of counsel, representation by counsel. So those are the four types of um, categories that this law would apply to. Uh, Ms. Kami talked about the, um, in the scope of relief, review for relief, that a person could go all the way back in someone's mental health history. The law requires that a person who petitions for relief under this has to sign um, a release to allow mental health or former guardians to discuss, to offer records that would be relevant to the issue of whether this person would be likely to be a danger in the future. Um, and so it is not an intent to go all the way back through someone's history. Um, I just wanted to make that point. And again, I, I, I know it's very concerning to people about veterans and post-traumatic stress disorder. This bill does not get to that. It is not the people who are suffering in our communities and seeking out help at the VA. Absolutely, it has to be someone who goes through this whole probate uh, process. With respect to the, um, the amendment, I understand uh, Attorney Nappin's wish for an annulment. My concern is that the language in the bill, in the amendment, um, which is on page three, lines four and five, says that the person whose record is annulled should be treated in all respects as if he or she has never been committed, not found incompetent, and that all of the records related to that will be sealed. We're talking about someone's mental health history or criminal um, court proceeding history. I think that it could be annulled for purposes of 
uh, rights to possess a gun under federal law, but if you annul and seal records for every purpose, it may prevent medical providers uh, and prosecutors from getting information that's really important in a subsequent um, treatment or subsequent criminal offense. So those are the comments I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Senator Rolowski? It seems the website is the only one. At, at any rate, um, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Attorney Wright. Uh, two quick questions. You said that it, it's not the intent to go back into someone's history in this bill. Is there a way we could make that clearer, do you think? Um, I suppose that we could somehow tailor the language to say um, <coughs> only relevant, uh, a release relevant, limited to information that's relevant to the court's findings. Um, I, I have to think about that. Okay, uh, if you would, I uh, appreciate that. You know, uh, unintended consequences. Um, the other one was the annul and seal, uh, which you just briefly talked. Is there also a way that that could be made clear? I, I think that there is a way to make that clear, um, at least that would address my concerns. Um, and I'm happy to try and address the language for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Senator Patalman. Okay, thank you. And I promise not to talk about them all. Okay, good. The Attorney General's office has supported this bill. That's correct. I have to quote something that I read. You can reserve the right to think, for even to think wrongly is better than not to think at all. You still think this bill is what we need in New Hampshire today? Absolutely. Thanks, are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time this Thank you. The chair will call um, Mr. Howie Zibble. Okay. Okay, the chair will call, um, is it Devin Chaffee? Yes. Uh, please come forward, Ms. Chaffee, and uh, Identify yourself for the record. I'm going to ask you to try to uh, really you know, have a, say what you have to say, and you know we, we need to move on because there's a lot of people waiting to testify. Certainly, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Devin Chafee. I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union, um, and uh, I want to say up front that I'm clearly uh, sympathetic with the desire to prevent uh, gun violence, and certainly understand why this body would want to take on that issue. Um, but my concern here is that the way that this bill is currently written, um, that it does not in fact make us safer and that it in fact perpetuates stereotypes uh, with regards to persons with mental disabilities. Any uh, approach to prevent gun violence should really be data driven and based on the facts. And my concern is that there are aspects of this bill that are not in fact uh, data-driven and that instead unnecessarily stigmatize people because of their uh, mental illness. In fact, there is no proven connection um, between individuals who are found, say, to be competent to stand trial or who have been appointed a guardian and any likelihood to be violent. And so there's been a lot of discussion today about due process and due process both on the front end when these four standards are, are determined, um, you know, whether it be you know, before a court and on the back end with regards to removal or with regards to annulment. But I think what also really needs to be addressed are, are these even the right standards in the first place? What is the connection between the individuals that are identified and, um, and singled out in this legislation and any threat to violence? Um, and I think that absent that data, we really need to consider what the negative consequences of singling those individuals might be with regards to perpetuating stereotypes and stigmas against persons with mental disabilities. So, you know, it, one might ask, so what? What is in a stigma? It, if it's just a stigma, is that really harmful? And I think it's very important that we recognize that stigmas against persons with mental disabilities have real negative consequences for our community. Unwarrantedly associating people with mental disabilities, with gun violence, does real harm to our community. It perpetuates the myth that people with mental disabilities are violent and pose a threat to others, despite the fact that they are, in fact, no more likely to be violent than anyone else. 
And this contributes to the isolation of people with mental disabilities, and it also discourages people from seeking mental health treatment for fear of being stigmatized or for fear of having their civil liberties restricted. Further restricting the rights of people with mental disabilities will not make us any safer from gun violence. Instead, it will set back, it will be a setback to years of progress in destigmatizing mental disabilities. It's important that we instead seek data-driven solutions to gun violence instead of these harmful stereotypes. And for these reasons, I respectfully urge the committee to recommend an expedient to legislate on SB 244. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions? Um, I just have a quick question. Have you seen amendment um, 2014-0069-S? Uh, I do have it here, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, as I don't know if you were in the room, but when I started the public hearing, I said we're going to be taking testimony uh, up until Friday, and because this was passed out today, many people are addressing the bill as written. They haven't seen the amendment, so if you would like to take a look at the amendment and send us your thoughts, I, I know I would really appreciate that. Well, I thank you for that invitation. I do just want to highlight that um, according to a quick read of this bill, I, I just received it today, that it does not appear that the four factors have been altered. So I think many of my concerns will still be relevant. But I do want to recognize that Senator Waters has indicated that he is open to, to, to future consideration. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I think you did. Um, but I, I, okay. so I, I'm certainly open to, to future discussions about how these concerns might be addressed. Okay, thank you. Senator Lansky. Thank you, and I apologize for the uh, interrupted. Just occurred to me, there is no data, uh, good morning, and thank you for being here. There is no data that connects um, severe mental illness or particular types of me mental illness or anything with people that are more likely to misuse a firearm. Well, I think is that, that what Is that what you're saying? The data that, that I have seen, in fact, points that mental health and um, psychiatric experts have found that less than 4% of any violent act in any given year could actually be attributed to a risk factor, factor of psychiatric disability. And in fact, most of those violent acts don't involve guns. So, and I, I think that what we really need to be focused on is, is there a risk, uh, an identifiable risk of violence? Um, is there a reason to believe that this person is in fact a danger to themselves or others? And I think if you look at the factors that are laid out in this bill, especially when it comes to incompetency to stand trial, and when it comes to um, having a guardian, that those just, there's no indication that those individuals pose any additional risk to violence than any, norm, any general person of the, of the general population. Uh, may I have more follow up? Yes. And I guess it's a decision, or well, would you agree that it is a decision for those making public policy to decide or determine that if one instance of a, you know, a heinous tragedy could be averted by something like this, then it is worth, worth the risk? Well, I think, I think one needs to, I think that any, like any public policy, we really need to be looking at the facts and the data, because the bottom line is that young males are in fact, if you, you know, I mean, it's very hard to determine what will cause anybody to eventually be violent, but young males are much more likely than the general population to commit violent acts. But I don't think they could ever consider barring all young males, especially over the age of 21, from having from, from having access to firearms in order to prevent one one incident. So I think as we're moving forward with public policy, we really have to be thoughtful about what is the connection um, between the public policy goal and the individuals that we are singling out, uh, whether you know, in this case for reporting to the federal government. I agree, but there is that doubt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, the chair will call Mike Skibby. Good morning, Mr. Skibby. Could you please identify yourself for the record? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Michael Skibby. I'm the Policy Director at the New Hampshire Disabilities Rights Center. Um, and I'm going to skip around a little bit in the hopes of not plowing old ground so that I can just give you some new information here. Um, speak in the mic. I will try to speak into the microphone. Um, so the Disabilities Rights Center um, opposes this legislation, and we would ask you to 
uh, recommend it in kind of exclusion to legislate. And I guess what I want to start with, um, in the hopes of bringing you some new information, is some of the procedural problems with the bill. Um, and first off, there's a problem with um, all of these categories of adjudicated mental illness or, or uh, disability, and that is how quickly um, the, um, the report has to be made. It has to be made within 15 days of the finding. Um, so the young woman that we represented um, about coming up on 10 years ago, who was found, who was involuntarily committed, and the Supreme Court later found that um, there really was diminishingly little evidence that she was dangerous to anyone, um, and therefore reversed the finding of involuntary commitment, involuntary commitment, she would um, still be in this registry. And it would not, there's no provision in here to provide for removing this entry just based on the finding of the reversal of um, a judicial finding of um, any of these categories. Um, even a motion to set aside the verdict or for a new trial, which typically has to be made very quickly after a judicial decision, typically within 10 days in a probate and superior court, um, although that would happen, the motion would have to be filed before 15 days, most of those hearings would happen many weeks after the, the, this entry would have to be entered. So procedurally, this doesn't fit for, I mean, if you're gonna take this extreme step of basically, you know, putting you know, an entire class of, or large groups of people um, in a category where they're unable to exercise one of their constitutional rights, it seems to me that at the very least you ought to have a procedure that um, can give you some confidence in the judicial decision that is going to underlie that finding, and I don't think this does that. Um, so that if, if one of these findings is set aside, the person has to go through the same procedure as I read the bill um, as anyone else. So they would have to go through you know, the releases and the petition and all of that stuff, spending the thousand dollars to the attorney that we heard from earlier. Um, um, moving to um, the categories themselves, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about incompetency to stand trial because of all of the categories, this is the one that has absolutely no relationship to violence or dangerousness at all. Um, you can be charged with um, shoplifting and found not competent to stand trial. You can never have committed any sort of dangerous act. You can be not guilty of shoplifting and you never get a chance to show that you were not guilty of shoplifting if you're found not competent to stand trial. So the idea that this equates with these other categories is just, it's, it's senseless. Um, you can, I mean, first of all, you can be not guilty. Second, secondly, um, um, that there is no, there's no distinction between um, levels of offense. I mean, we're not even restricting ourselves to people who've been found not guilty, I mean, not competent to stand trial for felony offenses or for violent felony offenses or any, any category that would be more closely tailored to dangerous behavior. Um, you, can, you can be charged with a crime in this and I think any other state without a judge ever finding that there's even probable cause to charge you. Um, you can bring a misdemeanor complaint in this state and never go before a grand jury, you never have a probable cause hearing before a judge if you're not, if there's no um, attempt to hold you without bail. And so there will never be a judicial finding that there was even an iota of evidence to charge you and you nevertheless can be found to have been not competent to stand trial and permanently disabled from exercising the constitutional right. Um, earlier, people said that you have an absolute right to counsel. That's not true in all cases. Um, you have a right to counsel in class A misdemeanors and felony offenses in this state. You don't have a right to counsel in class B misdemeanors or violations. And the competency proceedings that are, that are cited in the statute the, the statute that governs competency proceedings applies to class B misdemeanors and violation level offenses. And I certainly am familiar with cases when I was a public defender where people were found not competent to stand trial for serious motor vehicle offenses where there was no actual right to counsel. So it is entirely possible that somebody could be found not competent to stand trial for something that they were not guilty of. No judge ever found probable cause to believe that they, um, that there was any evidence to believe that they were guilty and they never had access to a lawyer. Um, with regard to guardianship, um, there, 
you, you could, I think, if you really stretch logic, say that there is some relationship between uh, being found in need of a guardian and dangerousness, but only if you're really stretching the English language. The standard um, for guardianship is um, that there is a risk of harm due to your inability to manage, to provide for your own personal needs or to manage property or financial affairs. Now that is not the same thing as dangerousness to self or others as we find in the involuntary commitment statute. Um, and I think that in my office, I wouldn't say it's frequent, but it's not uncommon for us to encounter um, clients who have guardians where they really never should have had a guardian appointed. I mean, it's not uncommon for a child with a disability to turn 18 and for all, you know, appropriate, um, you know, good motivations, um, the parents seek guardianship so that they can continue to manage the affairs of the, of the young adult. But, and, and the young adult acquiesces in the guardianship proceedings. But later on, years later, when the time comes for them to exercise more autonomy, they come to our office and it's, you know, it's quite clear that, they, that the standards for guardianship really were not ever satisfied. And we get those guardianships dissolved. But um, that, that kind of a person would still fall into this category where they would not be able to exercise a constitutional right. Um, with regard to um, involuntary commitment, um, it, that is probably the one that that um, that is less assailable of these categories. But I do want to make sure that you understand what it means to be involuntarily committed in this state. Um, New Hampshire uses involuntary commitment at a rate that is much higher than the national average, and we do it in a much more, I would say, severe way. We have the longest period of involuntary commitment in the nation by more than half, by more than twice. Um, and, um, you know, my office regularly encounters situations where the threat of involuntary hospitalization is used um, by community mental health providers to, um, to coerce people into acquiescing to treatment that they would otherwise decline. Um, in New Hampshire, the standard has been determined by, by the Supreme Court to include the possibility of harm due to failure to take care of yourself. Not because you're gonna do anything affirmatively dangerous to hurt yourself or affirmatively dangerous to hurt anyone else, but it is, has been found to include self-neglect. Now somebody who is not taking care of themselves is not somebody that we want to treat in the same way that, that someone who is likely to commit a violent act against another person. Um, I think that the last thing that I would say is that, um, is I, I suppose is going to reiterate a little bit what um, the Civil Liberties Union um, has, has uh, talked about today, and that is um, the problem of the lack of evidence of, of um, violence on the part of people with mental illness. I know that, um, Senator Lasky, you expressed some surprise that, that, that the evidence is so slim, but the evidence is very slim. Um, the study that I looked at last night is probably considered one of the best, where they looked at a, a group of people who had just been released from involuntary commitment to a hospital, and they compared their behavior for the months after their release to the behavior of similarly situated people in the same poor community. Because it's important to, to, to weed out those other factors. And they found that there was no difference in terms of dangerous behavior, with one exception, and that is people who were engaged in substance abuse as well as ha having mental illness. But even those people who were engaged in substance abuse had the same rate of dangerousness as people in the community sample who engaged in substance abuse. So it's pretty hard to say that it is therefore justified to pick out the one factor of having been involuntarily committed as a basis to deny them the opportunity to exercise a constitutional right. There is, there is some arguable evidence that first experience of psychosis might be different, um, but with the exception of that, plus people who have you know, significant substance abuse in combination with significant mental illness, I think that the evidence is pretty much absent. Um, and there's lots of incentive for people to come up with this evidence because there's lots of people who would like people to be subject to um, 
um, civil disability because of their mental illness. Unfortunately, that is true. And that is, and I guess, brings me to the last thing, which is the problem of stigma, which is if you have, if you, in the face of such little evidence, were to say, nevertheless, we were going to say to the population of thousands and thousands of New Hampshire citizens um, who are subject to these kinds of proceedings and who have, or who have mental illness alone, that you are at risk solely because of your disability to not be able to exercise a constitutional right. That sends a terrible message to them, and it sends a terrible message about them to our state. Um, and it's not just going to make people feel bad about their disability. And it's not just going to make people feel bad about the people that they see with mental illness. It has significant effects on the lives of people with mental illness. It affects their ability to be employed. It affects their ability to find safe and affordable housing. It affects their ability to associate with others in the community. So it has a significant effect. And I think that under those circumstances, you ought to recommend that this bill be found in its being to legislate. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Lasky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is Gibby. Thank you for being here. And you read my mind, and, and I was disturbed by lack of data, and I was going to ask you to that, and so I appreciate your bringing that up. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Skibby. Uh, the Chair will call Ken Norton. Please come forward, Mr. Norton, and identify yourself for the record, and I'm going to ask you to uh, please not repeat testimony that has already been given. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Ken Norton, and uh, I'm the Executive Director of NAMI New Hampshire, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And I'm here today um, to speak in partial support of um, SB 244, and specifically to recommend that a study committee or commission be established to further explore this important issue. Um, there are many complexities involved in this bill, and I hope you'll allow me to the opportunity to address them as part of my testimony. Um, and I won't cover ground that's already been covered, but homicide versus suicide, access versus purchase, mental illness and violence, which we've heard a lot about, voluntary versus involuntary versus probate commitment, the restoration process and dangerousness. And before I get into the specifics of these issues, I'd like to acknowledge that like many of you, I'm very conflicted about this bill. Um, the complexities involved offer the potential for personal, political, privacy, legal, and moral conflicts. And NAMI New Hampshire is conflicted due to the potential this bill has to reinforce the fears and stigma that people have about mental illness and violence, which uh, the two previous speakers spoke to so well. Um, will the fact that people with mental illness are more likely to be victims of crime rather than perpetrators be lost in this discussion? Will people be less likely to seek help if they believe their privacy will be violated or if they will lose access to their firearms? How do we weigh these considerations with the potential this bill has to stop an individual who is psychotic from killing others or someone who is severely depressed from taking their own life? While the bill probably makes many of us uncomfortable, I do commend Senator Waters for promoting the discussion about this important topic. Um, and, uh, and with that, I, I guess I would first say that while much of the attention of this bill focuses on homicide, the real issue around loss of lives is around suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of, of death in our state between the ages of 10 and 34. And it's the fourth leading cause of death in our state between the ages of 35 and 54. And that second leading cause of death is after, only after accidental injury. And we know many of those are, are likely, uh, or some of those are likely suicides. Um, and um, obviously, uh, suicide has huge impact in terms of families, communities, uh, society, businesses, and, uh, and how it impacts on us. But, uh, of those deaths in, in New Hampshire, which is consistent within the United States, about half of them, a little over half of them, are done by gunshot. Um, um, so that's an important part of this conversation that I think needs to be discussed. In terms of access to firearms, I think it's important to, um, to acknowledge that, that the issue is one of access, and preventing sales doesn't necessarily prevent access. Obviously, in New Hampshire, 
we have uh, the ability for individual firearm sales without any background check and that, that would um, mean that anybody who was uh, qualified as or disqualified under this, this law would still have the ability to legally purchase a firearm from an individual. So it's important to acknowledge that access piece. Um, uh, in terms of the issue of uh, emergency versus non-emergency admissions and voluntary, uh, uh, involuntary uh, commitments, I I'd like to, there's been so much disinformation that's already been put forward this morning. I'd like to maybe um, put a number to it to try to put this in perspective. That um, in New Hampshire, <laughs> there are approximately 2,500 involuntary emergency admissions, um, which is the three-day um, ad admission before, before a hearing in the state. Um, there are about 300 um, non-voluntary, um, non-emergency uh, admissions, excuse me, which is the probate piece, the piece which is under RSA um, 135C um, starting 34 and on. And that's the group that we're talking about here. So um, from conversations I had with Senator Waters, he changed that piece from the federal, the federal disqualifying piece of being any uh, involuntary emergency admission, that big piece, to this very narrow focus on individuals. And those folks are um, folks that an independent psychiatrist, in addition to the psychiatrist that files the petition, uh, reviews their um, record to determine uh, issues of dangerousness. Um, they do have uh, representation at court hearings. Uh, and, and, and so I think that's a very important part of this conversation, albeit to the point that, um, that Mike Skibby made from the Disabilities Rights Center. Even that, that classification of meeting the criteria for a probate commitment doesn't necessarily mean that somebody um, is, a, is a danger to society or perhaps even uh, likely to, uh, to be a danger to themselves. Um, often lost in the discussion about all of this is the fact that people from, with mental illness do recover. And of those 2,500 um, plus admissions to our state hospital every year, many of those are a one-time thing. I mean, that person is at a very difficult point in their life and, uh, and uh, they're admitted to the hospital, but, um, but they do get better, they do get treatment. And I think that that's an important consideration to an important part of having the annulment process, which we've heard so much about this morning, and uh, in that restoration. However, as, as you know, many other speakers have said, we do have real concerns about the cost of that and how an individual goes about doing that. And as Dr. Denesner testified, um, and, and would certainly say when I was doing clinical practice, um, if somebody were to ask me to predict violence for somebody, I might you know examine that person and say, well, I, you know. For today, I don't see that they're a danger to themselves or others, but predicting the future is very difficult. And so, you know, and, and I guess I would add to that, what is it that we're asking our judges to use to make the determining criteria for this? I mean, if somebody has been in treatment and they're taking medications and they keep all their appointments for the last, you know, three, four, five years, um, does that mean that they get to go ahead as opposed to somebody who hasn't been in treatment, hasn't been on medications, leading their life? seemingly doing very well. So, I mean, these things are, are quite um, complex. And finally, you know, the, uh, the real issue here is uh, the issue of dangerousness. And, um, and we're really disappointed, NAMI is disappointed that this bill does not really delve into dangerousness and solely focuses on the dangerousness of um, people with mental illness, which as you've heard from previous testimony, is really quite limited in terms of the overall dangerousness in terms of what we see from society. Um, substance abuse is part of the federal disqualification process for firearm purchase, um, but little has been done in this area relative to enforcement. And um, there are very dangerous people who have no diagnosed mental illness or substance abuse disorders who are well known to our communities, individuals like Carl Drago. And uh, we need to provide law enforcement with the tools to prevent any individual with a high risk of dangerousness from having access to firearms. Uh, a report, in terms of Senator Lasky's question, I would reference this report, and this report 
um, is about guns, public health, and mental illness, an evidence-based approach for federal policy. It was issued in December, and, uh, and this, had a, this report, we were very uh, torn about whether we were going to support this bill or oppose this bill, and I think this, this report tipped the scale for us. It does make a specific recommendation for, um, <coughs> for entering uh, uh, people who have been involuntarily admitted into the NICS database. Um, and it all, but it also talks about other aspects of dangerousness, people with multiple DWIs, people with um, violent offenses, people with domestic violence um, prior convictions, and those kinds of things. So I would, you know, I, I think this really does a good job of bringing the latest research together, and I would recommend uh, reviewing this. So with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for the opportunity to testify. We do really strongly recommend that that further study is needed given all of the disinformation that's already been spread regarding this. Thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Lasky. Thank you. Can you get a copy? I, or I have to submit this copy yes. with my testimony. Oh, okay. Thank you. Senator Cataldo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony today, by the way. I'm looking at what's happening in our society here in New Hampshire as far as the gun owners, or those who don't have guns, and commit suicide by using guns. Do you have a number ratio for that? Those who commit suicide by guns? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, Senator. Could you repeat If it? somebody commits suicide and they use a gun, yes. do we have data on how many people have done that in the state? Yes, um, it's, it's over, it's about 53 or 54 percent of the actual suicide deaths in New Hampshire, which have been averaging <coughs> around uh, 200 deaths per year. Okay. To follow up, Madam Chair? Yes. And if they didn't have a gun, would they still commit suicide? Um, that's very unclear, um, but the, um, the ability to save somebody who has made an attempt, um, about 90% of the people who use a firearm in a, in a suicide attempt die by suicide, as opposed to other methods of um, suicide, hanging for instance, or poison, um, the, the percentages of people who are saved um, are much higher than that. I think part of what needs to be said about suicide is that despite the sort of portrayal, um, a lot of the research indicates that most people really are very ambivalent about dying, um, as evidenced by the fact that 90% of people who attempt suicide who do not die, do not go on to die by suicide. One more follow-up. Yes, so if they didn't have a gun, they would find another way to commit suicide. Not necessarily, but a gun is very lethal and it's very, in that moment, um, you know, very deadly. Uh, so the intent is they wish to die? They wish the pain to end. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. The chair will call, I believe it's Glenn Wallace. And please, sir, I would ask you to yes, be very concise in your in your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Glenn Wallace. I'm with Rath and Young. And I'm here representing the National Shooting Sports Foundation, NSSF. Um, I'll try to refer to them as the foundation because trying to say NSSF, NSSF <laughs> repeatedly is going to be a problem. Uh, this is the national trade organization for the, for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the firearms industry. They represent gun manufacturers, ammunition manufacturers, gun dealers, shooting ranges, and hunting and other sport, shooting sports organizations. Stern Ruger and Sig Sauer here in New Hampshire are both board members of NSSF, and they are both supportive of this legislation. Um, the leadership of the foundation apologizes for not being here today. They are having this week their annual big gathering in Nevada, and they are all there, so they cannot be here. Um, 
The written testimony that I've given you details their Fix NICS program. Mm -hmm. This foundation has been involved for a couple of years now trying to get the states that are um, behind, so to speak, in reporting folks to improve their systems for reporting. New Hampshire is one of those states. So they've been hard at work on doing that. Um, <clears throat> so I'll ask you to read that and get a little information in history. Um, I know that you have been, as you have detailed, you've been getting a lot of phone calls and such. Um, I would like to point out that um, this organization is the trade organization for the firearms industry. These are folks who make guns, who sell them, and who, who deal with the hunting, who would like to promote hunting and the shooting sports. They're not the kind of folks who would help you pass a bill that infringes on anyone's Second Amendment rights. Um, in the italicized portion of the written testimony, you'll notice that there are several states that recently have passed bills that are very similar to this, this one. And just I would note that Mississippi, the state Senate passed this bill by a 51 to 0 vote, and Mississippi House passed it 116 to 1. Um, I don't think that you'd have folks in Mississippi and Louisiana and some of those states at the risk of uh, stereotyping. Those are folks who, like us, um, have a great deal of respect for the Second Amendment. We do, we do recognize that there are portions of this bill that may need to be fixed, as in fixed mix, and you certainly stand as one of the stakeholders ready to work with the other stakeholders from the mental health community, from the courts, and gun groups, and whatever, to work on it further. But NSSF feels that this is very important legislation, and they feel that Senator Waters bill is a very good bill, and they would like to see it passed. Um, we, this is nothing new, this is ongoing, it should be noted in other states. Other states are fully compliant or mostly compliant with this federal, federal law and federal regulation right now. And as far as some of the testimony you've heard about the possible nightmare scenarios and things going on like that, we're not seeing that in other states. So what could be doesn't seem to be happening in the states that are compliant and the states that have passed this in the past few years and are fully into the system. Um, I will answer any questions I can. Anything that I can, I will get the answers from my client. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. The chair will call David Love. Please come forward, Mr. Love, and identify yourself for the record. My name is David Love, I'm Derry, and uh, you know, I'm not the head of any organization. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just an average citizen, mm -hmm. a disabled carpenter, to be exact. But, uh, you know, as I sit here and listen to all the testimony, I do appreciate all the well-meaning people in, in favor of this. I am in opposition. Um, I, it reminds me of a 1950s quote by then Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson. He said, when cons considering legislation, we have to not only look at what good the legislation will do if implemented, <coughs> implemented rightly, but the damage it will do when it's implemented wrongly. And uh, th this is, is full of that. It's uh, the opportunity for, to implement it wrongly to me is uh, is, uh, is really high. I am, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm a, I'm a history buff, I guess you could say. And uh, you know, uh, throughout history, uh, you know, gun control and gun confiscation has always led to, to tyranny and and, mm -hmm. uh, and and not good things. Adolf Hitler started with with, with bills like this. You know, the, the mental health records uh, started. Uh, you know, his, uh, his confiscation of uh, the weapons. Uh, and he got the mental health records through the universal health care, go figure. Um, you know, when uh, Representative Waters, with all due respect, and uh, with the risk of sounding mildly sarcastic, um, when he was talking uh, about the Second Amendment, and he, he said, uh, you know, he used the word infringed, and then he said, he said, uh, unless there was a constitutional amendment yesterday, um, my copy says it has a, has a dot after the word infringed, and that's a period. That means end of discussion. We have a mental health treatment problem in this country. We don't have a gun problem. The, the Representative Belsaro mentioned dozens of different, different ways that uh, you know people are killed in this country, and uh, you know guns are real low on the list. And uh, you know, if somebody want, when uh, somebody was talking about uh, mental health and, uh, and suicide, if somebody wants to kill themselves, they can go jump in front of a truck. They can jump off a bridge. And if they want to do it and, and get the job done, they can do it. Uh, you know, gun, guns are not the problem. Um, that's it, I guess. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions? I just have a, a quick question for you. Um, 
Do you think that it would be an opportunity for the legislature to study this issue? Would you support something like that? Once again, the risk of sounding sarcastic is a dot after infringed. Okay. That means end of story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Uh, the chair is called James Bryant. Please come forward, Mr. Bryant, and identify yourself for the record. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Bryant, James Bryant. I live in Antigua, New Hampshire. And I'm here to support uh, this bill because it impacts, uh, as it has happened to me through the mental health system, that I would like you to be aware of and perhaps you can speak in the mic. Um, please keep your comments. I, I understand, I can see that people are gesturing. Um, but you could upset somebody by yelling from the back, so I'm going to ask you please do not shout out comments from the audience. Sir, could you please speak into the microphone? I shall try. Thank you. Yes, I have a very soft voice. In the spring of 2006, I had a, a nervous breakdown. I don't remember too much about it except that I had one, and the next thing I knew I was in the state hospital. Uh, thanks to my support from my family and my community, uh, I successfully went through that uh, that uh, experience. If you haven't had a nervous breakdown, I highly recommend you get one. It can be very, it can be very uh, awakening to your to your own life. We all tend to carry a lot of rocks in our backpacks, and occasionally we need to stop and get rid of them. And the time out in that facility really allowed that to happen to me. Having said that. After I was, uh, I was uh, scheduled to be there for 10 days and the folks in the facility said, you can go home after nine if you don't see any issues here with you. I followed up on that personally by continuing to see a counselor locally because I felt that there were perhaps still some unresolved issues, those issues that didn't put me there to begin with, that I still needed to explore. I subsequently did and after a three month, a three month uh, stay with that, um, I was asked, what are you coming back here for, Jim? And uh, I subsequently terminated my counseling. And uh, I had uh, shown my interest in getting my firearms permit back. We live in the country. And, he, and both counselors signed a letter saying, Jim is just fine and we endorse having his firearms returned to him. The next step was then to find a way to get to the legislate, get to the laws that would allow that to happen. So I called an attorney and I was subsequently referred to a, a so-called gun rights, uh, firearms rights attorney here in Concord. Uh, and I will say that with tongue in cheek in my mouth because the attorney that I was referred to was more of an accountant than it was an attorney. And I spent, uh, my wife and I spent close to $13,000 trying to get this litigated. <coughs> I think that the person that we employed to represent our case already knew what the law was. And we were just being carried on and on and on. It left me with a very cynical attitude about both attorneys and what their motives are. Subsequently, I, uh, I, I, I talked to two other attorneys about this matter. And they shook their heads and couldn't believe the amount of money that had been spent trying to get back on track with just the ability to find a path to explore getting my gun rights back. That's all I wanted. An objective reevaluation of the situation to see if I was qualified to get that back. This attorney that we paid so much money for eventually said, well, you know, we can pursue this, but it's gonna cost you another 10,000, maybe even more money. Well, the last attorney that I had seen spent about two and a half hours with me looking at the laws and said, New Hampshire doesn't have a law that we can, that we can appeal to. There's no, it comes to a dead end in the middle of the night out there somewhere. There is no way to go beyond that. So the purpose of this bill, which I hope I had influence in, in, in uh, bringing forward to the council, at least from my own selfish point of view, 
may give me an opportunity to revisit my case with the court to find out if I'm qualified to get my firearms permit back, which is very important to me. It, if nothing else, as a matter of principle, it's important to me. And um, just looking for a path to redemption here, you know, and that's what I'm asking the legislature to consider is to put some methodology at the end of your legislation that allows those of us who have had our firearms taken away from us for whatever reason to have it reviewed after a period of time. And I've had documentation that would support that uh, from the mental health people all up and down the lines. But New Hampshire doesn't have a law to support that. So I'm asking that that be considered. Firearms and mental health are real touchy issues in this country right now and probably should be. But be very careful, I would suggest that you need to be very careful about defining mental health. It's got a stigma attached to it. It's like saying I'm sick, which means anything from I've got a stomach ache to I'm dying from cancer. It comes under a great huge umbrella and there are various di differentiation levels of mental health and, and how it affects the individual. And as you look at any legislation that you might consider, please keep that in mind and try to build language into it that accommodates at least the path to have one's case for you. Uh, one of your previous guest speakers here was asked um, if Sandy Hook could have been prevented. I believe that was a very excellent question. And I sat back there and I said, no, incidents like that cannot be prevented. It's like trying to prevent a suicide bomber from setting off a bomb in Fallujah. It's, it's just a, a, one of those evil natures of some human beings. It doesn't stop us from flying. But let's be very careful about the path that we pursue and, and focus on the right potential solution for that as opposed to blanketing the entire population. <coughs> And as we know, with the dissemination of information on this uh, National Security Agency, information right now is very sensitive because we might lose our private, we might lose our privacy, uh, which is very dangerous. So, as you look at this legislation, I'm only asking that you create a path for those of us that clearly have a right to pursue that. Don't just make it a dead end for us. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions? Thanks for having me. Seeing no questions again, thank you very much. The chair will call Jack Kimball. Please come forward, Mr. Kimball. Identify yourself for the record. I'm going to ask if um, that you have some new things to offer to the committee. We've had a lot of testimony this morning, and I ask that you not repeat that. Good morning. Good morning. Some faces I recognize, some I don't. But uh, my name is Jack Kimball. I'm a resident of Dover, New Hampshire, and a businessman in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And Senator Catalo, hello. Since Sam's my son. I'm here uh, because I absolutely uh, against SB 244 should be an ITL bill. Uh, and here's my reason why I come at this from a different viewpoint. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the good Senator Waters uh, didn't. Uh, uh, sponsored this bill for the reason that I'm going to speak to. We're seeing nationally a move toward gun confiscation in the United States of America. Never, never thought I'd see that day. But as far as I'm concerned, this bill is a camel's nose under the tent, which is leading toward that very thing. What we have right now nationally with our military and our veterans that are getting out of theater and have been diagnosed with PTSD, They've already been told that they cannot keep weapons. They're going to have their guns confiscated. And these are the very men that are fighting, bleeding, and dying for us on the battlefields uh, around the, the world, Afghanistan specifically. A lot of them have PTSD while they're in. They're being treated for it actively. But they're still running around with their M16s, their M4s, and their machine guns, and doing their duty very bravely. Why is it then that when they get out, they're no longer worthy uh, to be treated with that same respect. This makes no rational sense to me. The only thing that's going to happen, in my view, with this bill 
is that it's, it, this bill is in the hunt of a problem or the cure of a problem that really doesn't exist. And what's going to happen is more often than not, the people that are going to be affected by this bill are going to probably be people who have never committed a violation of the law. Uh, there are people who abide by the law, have run into some difficulties and problems, but they're going to be negatively affected by this and it's going to be very costly for them to resolve it. Again, statistically, I don't think you have a problem here. This bill is in search of a cure for one that does not exist. The other thing I think that's critically important to me personally is that all of you senators, as well as uh, the state reps that are in here today, and I'm a prior Navy guy, and I took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution uh, from all enemies, foreign and domestic. That oath didn't uh, die the day I left the military, I can assure you. But you all take similar oaths uh, to protect, defend, and uphold the Constitution of both the United States and the state of New Hampshire. The biggest part of that Constitution, in my view, is the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is the protector of the entire Constitution. The right of the, keep, the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed leaves no wiggle room for any of you. It is critically important that your oaths of office always be at the forefront of your minds when you're talking about any legislation, particularly legislation that concerns our right to keep and bear arms. So today I'm here to caution you. Be very careful. Please don't push this bill forward. This is going to be truly the camel's nose under the tent to gun confiscation in this country. It is a great issue and a great matter. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kimball. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank, thank you. The chair will call Earl Sweeney. And I apologize, Mr. Sweeney, I didn't see you um, sitting back there. That's okay. Uh, if I may, I'll uh, bring Sergeant uh, Hagerty, who runs sure. the gun line uh, for us. And uh, I'll be very brief. I brought him thank in case you. you had any questions about how the, uh, the gun line operates. But uh, we would certainly make him available uh, to you if you were born at any time. Just, just give him a call or whatever. Um, I'll leave a copy of, uh, of uh, my written testimony. And if I may also, because at my age I only buy note for the funny, uh, in case I don't make it for your next bill, I'd also like to leave my, my testimony for that. <laughs> well, that's one never knows. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Basically, what I've done in my written testimony is to, is to give you uh, an outline of how the mix system works, uh, how things get into the mix index, uh, and how our, uh, how our gun line works. So it's all in the written testimony, and I won't, uh, I won't get into that. If uh, you go to a federally licensed firearm dealer to buy a handgun, uh, you have to the, the gun dealer has to go to the uh, state police and, and inquire of the gun line, which is open 12 hours a day, 363 days a year. Excuse me, Mr. Shorty, could you please move forward and speak to the microphone? Sure. Thank you. And, uh, and if you buy a, a long gun, a rifle, then you, uh, uh, you go directly to the, uh, to the FBI. New Hampshire is one of a few states, seven states, I believe, that to handle it this way, with handguns being handled one way and uh, rifles being handled the other, and uh, I honestly don't know why. Uh, we're also one of only 17 states that don't enter mental health data into the next system. And the probably the biggest flaw that we have in, 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 in relying on an check is that we don't have mental health data. Uh, somebody could have walked out of a mental institution this morning on a conditional discharge, stroll into a gun dealer shop, and apply to purchase a gun. And neither our gun line personnel or the next database would know anything about it. Uh, every year we do have several people that are denied <coughs> because they're New Hampshire residents who uh, got into the, into the next database because they were formerly a resident of another state 
and uh, had a, a mental health issue. On the other hand, we've had people from our state who should not have purchased guns or successfully purchased them in another state. Uh, I purchased a, a handgun last summer and uh, I had to sign a federal form that I had never been uh, adjudicated as a mental defective and so forth. Uh, my son and grandson and I went shooting at the range in Belmont uh, on Saturday and uh, I had to sign a similar form for the, for the guy that runs the range and I think that he was just doing it to protect himself. I don't see any need, any requirement, legal requirement that he had to, to have us sign that, but uh, we did have to. <coughs> if I had been uh, denied, if I had a federal disqualifier, I would have been committing a federal crime if I had uh, not no on that form. I think you've heard everybody say that, you know, there's only, there's only four mental health disqualifiers. This is not uh, designed for somebody who goes in to, to get counseling because they've had a, a messy divorce. It's not uh, uh, for some firefighter, police officer, soldier uh, who's had, uh, who's grappling with, with issues of, uh, of uh, some of the terrible things that they've been exposed to in this as sorts of health. This is an adjudication by the court, and as has been mentioned, it's not just for a temporary uh, seven-day stay in a mental institution. It's somebody that's been found uh, to be uh, to be me either mentally incompetent or or uh, dangerous to themselves or others, and uh, have an ongoing mental illness. I think the two things that we need to have is a way to put those few individuals into the mix system and a way to recognize their rights, just as this gentleman who testified a few minutes ago, uh, if they're okay, to get their name removed. And I think those are the two things that this, that this bill does. And uh, my concern is that if we don't do something, my concern as a, as a gun owner is that if we don't do something about this, but sooner or later something will happen and there'll be an overreaching and there'll be some kind of a draconian uh, piece of legislation passed. And I think this is a pretty reasonable uh, piece of legislation. Um, Senator Waters did a good job of, of uh, I think, finding most of, the, most of the flaws and most of the hot points. And uh, I have no problem supporting it as a, as a law enforcement officer, as a gun owner, as a grandfather and a father, I, I think it's a good, solid piece of legislation, and I don't uh, see uh, the uh, evil uh, people coming to confiscate guns as a result of this. And, and you can always argue that maybe it's the first, first step, but remember, every one of those steps requires legislation. So it isn't a case where it's just going to expand all by itself. So. Uh, on that basis, I believe it's a, uh, it's a good bill. I'm glad to answer any questions, or if you have any technical questions, the sergeant would uh, be happy to answer them or to uh, respond to you by email or, or phone them if you so desire. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the committee? Thank Seeing none, much. thank you very much. Um, let's see, the chair will call Chris Leone. Is that Leone or Leone? Please come forward, sir, and identify yourself for the record. <coughs> Do we have two Chris Leones? No, I'm sorry, I'm Chris Leone. Uh, ah, no. This is Dr. Andy. Okay, so um, you folks want to testify together? Yeah, yes, please. Okay, so please make sure that you identify yourselves for the record. Sure. And please, um, it's already testimony we've had. We don't need to hear it again. And if you've got written testimony, please don't. Okay. okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Um, I don't want to be redundant on anything. Um, well, first of all, my name is Chris Leone. Um, I'm here representing myself. Um, and this is Dr. Joe Hannon. That, uh, I'm going to touch on a few points that have not been brought up yet uh, as far as the, the, the medical side. Uh, this bill. 
Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up uh, that has not been discussed, that has not been discussed yet, is that I find it alarming, very, very alarming, that this bill, number one, could be introduced uh, by a senator, and then also by Mr. Mr. Goley representative. And the most alarming thing that I saw in this bill was the last sentences of immunity for certain personnel of the court system. I cannot believe that somebody would attach their name to this and submit it as a piece of legislation before the general court that has that on there. Um, I, I was so taken back by that, I, I just had to say something about that in the this today. And yet everybody that has come forward today supporting this legislation, not one person, not one, has said anything about that clause in this bill. The last four sentences of this bill, um, providing immunity. What kind of society do we have, or would we have, if any one of us had a job where we would not be accountable for our actions or anything we did? And yet here we're going to craft a law, and in this, in this law, we're going to give immunity to people that are playing with other people's rights or could possibly make a mistake with other people's rights. Uh, I just find it appalling. Uh, I think that's enough said on that. Um, also, we have taken quite a bit of time going through this bill, and all these everybody that has supported this, I, I can't, I don't believe that they actually read the legislation that's that's in front of them, and all the RSAs that that this points to, and how these all mingle together, and what the other RSAs that are referred to in this bill actually say, because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a doctor, but when I read them, it's pretty clear to me that this bill cannot be fixed. It touches on so many things that the only the only thing that this bill can do is to be ITL. It can't be put in a committee of conference. It cannot be amended. Um, it refers to too many pieces of legislation that um, I'm not going to, to go into because there's some people coming up behind me that are a lot more professional in that area that are really going to put it into perspective of what this actually does. Um, so I'm going to leave it to that. And uh, I'd like to um, ask Dr. Joe Hannon here to, to he's had some quite some quite a bit of medical experience, and if he could share some of his experiences on the medical side of what this feels like. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Henning. Uh, I'm uh, retired from medicine, so I'm not an actively practicing doctor, but a, um, I, I'll say I'm a father of a child with Down syndrome, a five-year-old girl, who would be considered prohibited by the federal laws because of her mental condition, diagnosis only. Uh, I had an interesting discussion with my wife recently, who's an emergency room physician, who uh, assured me she didn't commit anyone last night at work. But um, the, uh, we, we were talking about my, you know, she's only five, and we were wondering would she be able to have a firearm when she was older? And I talked to a lawyer about this, um, and I was told no, even if she had a normal IQ. For no other reason than she has a diagnosis that is on the federal umbrella of a prohibited person. Um, we have a long history in this country of prohibited people. Blacks were three-fifths of a person for the longest time. The, some of the earliest gun control laws were in New York because the Irish didn't have the mental capacity to have a firearm. Uh, we know that there's things in which I'm Irish, so I disagree with. But uh, you know, in Europe, we've seen uh, the Jews were persecuted because they didn't have the mental capacity. It wasn't because these people were necessarily black, Jewish, or Irish. They were not allowed. The reasons given were mental capacity. You couldn't, they didn't just say, oh, they're too dark for this, or they're too Irish, or whatever, or too Jewish. They didn't have the mental capacity. This is not a gun control bill. This is not a public safety bill. This is legalized discrimination that stigmatizes people that have conditions that you may or may not think deserve to have a gun. Now, I've had lots of discussions with very extremely strong pro uh, Bill of Rights people and people that are very against the Bill of Rights. The one thing they have in common that it seems, not everybody, but most people seem to want those people to not have firearms. I don't think this crazy person or that crazy person, and they're throwing around terms, and even people that are supporting mental health, except for some of the experts we've had here today, it's stigmatizing every person and putting them under an umbrella because of your personal prejudices and, I'm, I'm sorry, good intentions do not give someone an expertise. 
I don't want certain people to have firearms, but I don't have that right. You're legislators, you don't want certain people and you believe that certain people should not be able to possess them. You have the ability, and we've heard that some people say that you don't have the right, but I'll leave that up for discussion amongst yourselves. You're going to make a decision one way or another. The, the, some of the consequences of these actions are people, and we've heard uh, an expert psychiatrist testify that people will seek, you know, people not seeking treatment has nothing to do with this, and even though there's a hysteria about not going to your doctor because you're going to be reported, it's unfounded. We've heard people say, after hearing that, I'm not going to a doctor. So I don't know what you're going to do to prevent people from not seeking treatment. We want people to get treatment. Everybody in here wants people that have issues to seek treatment. This will prevent some people. Will it prevent some people from getting a firearm? It may or may not, but nobody can say for sure. And no medical expert, even the ones who have testified today, cannot, no one has said that with any certainty can it be predicted that someone with a mental illness or disease is going to commit a crime. As far as the appeals process, we've heard, oh, there, there's lots of pro, there's a, one pro-gun group that, and another firearms industry lobbyist who have gotten up here and said, we have an appeals process, so it's okay. That tepid support is easily blown out of the water by the, uh, the psychiatrist who came up here and said, well, not many doctors are going, you know, they can't really say, and I'm paraphrasing, if I'm wrong, I'm sure I'll give you a letter sent to you soon, but they can't predict who is not going to be violent. So if someone appeals, they're going to have to get a doctor who is going to put their reputation on the line saying this person is probably not going to be violent. I don't know any doctor who can say that. They're afraid of being sued. They're afraid of being wrong. Doctors are like lawyers. They're overly cautious. Ask a lawyer an opinion, they'll give you a maybe answer. Ask a doctor, they're probably going to give you the same answer. They're not going to put themselves in the line. They, some people may be able to appeal, but a lot of people are going to have a hard time finding an expert to say, I don't think this is going to happen. So it is an extremely founded, grounded fear in people's minds that this is possible. When, um, after Katrina, I was in New Orleans for an extended period of time helping rescuers. I'll wrap this up soon. I spent most of my time working with the police, not just in New Orleans, but all over the country, and military personnel. These people didn't have medicines, they couldn't get their prescriptions, and we had to scrounge and get them from different agencies and private individuals to get them the medicines they needed. I was astounded of how many people that were in these professions, military, firefighters, police, that have psychiatric issues that are taking medication. Now, these people would be prohibited from their jobs if this was ever found out. They have to go to county, a different doctor, a different county, use a fictitious name. Well, that might have worked 10 years ago, but the way that the new healthcare law is going, we're not going to be able to have completely anonymous records in the future. Um, call it paranoid, but it's, it's happening. Uh, as far as people confiscating, this is not a confiscation bill, I agree. But there are places in the country that are confiscating people who are on a prohibited persons list. California, Governor Brown, has just approved 24 million, has appropriated $24 million to, a quad, to basically get SWAT teams and police with automatic weapons and tanks, or not tanks, but armored personnel, to remove firearms from these prohibited persons lists. They're taking about 5,000 a week, I, I think, offhand. I'm not, not sure about the fact, but this figure, but it's a large number of people they're trying to take forcibly. This is happening because they're on a list. So this history, this country has a history of treating the mentally ill, and I'm backtracking real quick. We have a history of treating the mentally ill with a lot of discrimination in the past. It's not even 100 years ago in this country, over 60,000 people with mental disabilities and handicaps were forcibly sterilized by agents of the state. California was one of the biggest uh, offenders of that, North Carolina, several other states because we didn't want them breeding. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going on here, but this country has a history of treating the mentally uh, ill as having a separate rule, set of rules that should apply to them, and that's not the case. If someone has been adjudicated in court as being a violent offender, nobody that I know of could say that person should be denied certain privileges. But this is not a privilege, this is a right. You have to have a very high standard to remove someone's right. And a court of law is one of those things, but these health courts were created, they have little hearings in the basement of the mental health hospital and other places. They have these hearings in this country, and there's a push to get more mental health courts to adjudicate these things. One last thing, 
This bill is premature for another major reason. In the past, this month, there are two proposals from the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice through the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives and whatever else they can add to it. They are changing the rules about who is entered into the NICS system and what definitions of some of these terms are. Uh, here, it's in, here, we're talking about in, people committed to an inpatient facility. They're proposing to change the rules to people uh, who are involuntarily committed to inpatient or outpatient facilities. That could potentially qualify anybody who's ever gone to divorce court or for a child custody hearing who has been ordered to take therapy, ordered for court ordered therapy for those issues, because that's involuntary, the judge ordered it. So anyone who's been divorced or had a child custody case could potentially be barred as a prohibited person according to the new rules. So that's one thing. The other is the HIPAA relaxation that is proposed. The Health and Human Services is trying to make it easier for doctors to give medical information that is private, confidential, and considered sacred by many doctors. The, we heard an expert earlier say that, oh, I can't give certain information because of these rules. Well, a week ago, they proposed changing these rules. So that argument is completely blown out of the water. It holds no protection for people. Should something be done about dangerous people and criminals having firearms? It's, it's a discussion I think anybody is willing to have, but this bill is bad on its face. This is not a gun control or safety bill. This is legalized discrimination. This is basically a good intention bill that has no reason to pass. It's overreaching and prejudicial and stigmatizes many good citizens of New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you, gentlemen. Um, the chair will call Wolford M. Is it Royfel? Yes. Please come forward and identify yourself for the record, sir. I wasn't too sure about that, but I figured I'd give it a, and depart the pun, I'd give it a shot. <laughs> My name is Bill Boykel. Some of you may know me from my articles in the Harper Magazine. Former president, five years of the National Fishing Game Association, life member of the NRA, member of other gun organizations, and so forth. Well, unfortunately, most of the speakers that have been here have already stole my thunder. So this is going to be fairly brief. Uh, I wish my, uh, uh, our uh, psychiatrist friends were here so they could corroborate something that I read one place. Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychiatry, is purported to have said, and this is going to speak up to a lot of people, that fear of weapons is a sign of uh, mental instability and sexual instability. Now, take that for what it's worth. I thought it was kind of funny myself. Um, in looking at this legislation, what I see without going into ex excruciating detail is that it's extremely broad. It paints too big a brush. Um, it's the camel's nose under the tent. And we all know what that means. Once the camel gets his nose under the tent, he keeps squirming and working and changing things until all of a sudden he's in the tent and you're stuck with him. And as every type of legislation like this, uh, that generally is what happens. All of a sudden it is so big you don't know what to do with it, you can't change it, you can't do anything, you're stuck with it. And as the pre previous uh, two gentlemen pointed out, this is discriminatory to a large extent. It is just no, no definitions really of what defines a psychiatric problem that would negate a person losing his constitutional rights. I didn't see it in there. 
Maybe it's there, maybe it isn't, but I didn't see it. Another thing that I'd like to point out is this is precisely the same thing that Hitler and Stalin did in the 30s. They simply declared that their opponents were all crazy, rounded them up, threw them into institutions from which they disappeared. Now, does anybody think that couldn't happen here? Oh well, think about it. Let's see, what else was I gonna say? Well, I think I pretty much covered it. Uh, this, this is a bill that should be taken a lot, long, loud, hard look at before it is passed. I'm not against having real mental defectives put on the NICS, but let's do it the right way. Let's not discriminate. Let's not do stupid things to innocent people because it feels good. There's far too much legislation that goes down as being feel good. Let's not do it with this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your testimony. Are there any questions from the question. committee? Yeah. Senator Catalan. Hang on. Somebody got a question. One of the things that I, I, I like to respond a lot to is my emails. And uh, since I do read my emails, and I know we all do, one of the things they talked about, and uh, you, you, hit a, you hit a spot for me, Phil. The bill only enhances the movement towards government domination. The very thing the founders sought to eliminate. Do you agree? Exactly. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony this morning, sir. The chair will call Theodore Junko? Janakis. okay. Well, see, I got one name right, I got one wrong. Um, please come forward, sir, identify yourself for the record. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask you again, if you've got something written, please don't read it, and if you can paraphrase it, and give us some new testimony, that would be terrific. Uh, my name is uh, Theodore Janakis, I'm a retired Master Sergeant, Fifth Special Forces Group at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 23 years. Um, I've seen some time in hostile areas, liberated the oppressed in Central America. Um, veterans like myself, we fought to defend the Constitution of the United States, not have it taken away from us in little uh, laws that cut the last two cars off the train instead of dealing with the real problem. Uh, guns isn't a real problem, revolving door justice is. Uh, we should enforce the laws that we already have. If there's gun-related crimes, make it a stricter law. Put them in jail for 20 years. Don't let them out. If they come back out and they redo the crime again, put them on death row. The fear of, the fear of God in them is going to predict a lot of these guys and discriminate them from doing this stuff. The honest citizens of this country that vote and put our lawmakers into office shouldn't be victimized. And that's what I feel. There's a lot of history out in that hallway. This is the first time I've been in this building. And this law really hurts the people in that hallway who held all those flags. And I just ask you to put this into study or kill this bill. I agree 100% what Mr. Kimball said uh, three or four testimonies ago, and that's all I have to say to this committee. Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Are there any uh, questions? Just one thing that Sir, would you be willing to answer uh, a question? Just, just thank you for your service, by the way. Thank you very much. You're welcome. If I had it all over to do again, I would do it again. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the chair will call Mitch Kopass. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Kopass. Good morning. Please identify yourself for the record. I'm going to tell you we've had a lot of testimony this morning and ask you not to repeat don't any you, testimony we've already Don't you had. worry, I don't plan to. Okay. I'm going to be quick. Uh, let me get my glasses so I can read my quick testimony. Um, i got to say that uh, Gunners New Hampshire, I am the president of Gunners New Hampshire. My name is Mitch Kopass. I am also the president of Pelham Fishing Games. Um, I represent thousands of gun owners in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, our organization was mentioned by Senator uh, Waters earlier. I almost forgot the word the bill. It's been here so long. Uh, Senator Waters earlier. Uh, we had some discussions about this, and my our, our, our position has not changed. This bill needs to be IPL. So, uh, Congressman Hampshire is opposed to this legislation. After carefully reviewing this legislation, conferring with other New Hampshire citizens, 
in an effort to eliminate redundancy, which is what I'm doing right now, we would uh, defer my time and testimony to people that have already spoken and some attorneys that are coming forward who understand uh, legalese and doctorese much better than I do. Dr. Hannah was one of the people and you will hear some, from some attorneys uh, after me. But please understand that we represent thousands of gun owners. Uh, I don't think that uh, Senator Waters' intent was bad. I just think this is bad legislation. And to uh, quote uh, Representative Coffey, uh, we can't fix a bad bill. We've tried before. Uh, and Senator Cataldo can tell you, we tried to fix bad legislation. We, it, it can't be done. This bill should be killed. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Are there any questions? Sure. Um, Senator Catalano. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lopez. Uh, the Gunners of New Hampshire is an affiliate of the state affiliate of the NRA, correct? Yeah. And how is the feeling of the NRA towards this bill? Well, if you read the uh, what the NRA has said um, in their alert, they don't say that they support it, and they don't say that they're against it. So, it, it, in my opinion, what what I'm seeing from their alert is they stand neutral, and I think that's what's happening right now. Um, they, they again, like as, as, as a discussion I've had with them, is uh, they don't believe the intent is bad of Senator Waters, uh, but this uh, is the wrong bill. I can't speak for them on that, but I, I can tell you that that's what we said. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to say Senator Waters uh, and uh, Senator, excuse me, uh, Earl Sweeney had said about NICS um, the state level handles handguns, the, the, the federal handles long guns. Now, um, uh, Ann Rice said it was very simple to get your name removed from the NIC system, which is absolutely correct at the state level. The state, and I'm sure uh, um, Earl Sweeney will correct me if I'm wrong, sends the information on to the feds. There is no way that they can make the feds take your, your name off the long gun list. Two separate, two separate locations. Uh, you can be qualified by a handgun and not by a long gun. And I'm getting this uh, anecdotal evidence from uh, gun dealers that, and people have had this situation happen. Uh, their name is improperly on the list. They can buy handguns because New Hampshire fixed the problem. The federal government hasn't been fixed it, and we have no control over what the feds do, as we know. So, uh, and again, to uh, the doctor's stuff, uh, they can change the laws, they can change the definition of words once we've done this, and now we're stuck with those definitions. So, I did, is that brief? You're, You're good. Thank, You're you. good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kopas. Um, the chair will call. Um, Kevin Bloom. Good afternoon, Mr. Bloom. You Good stuck afternoon. out. Great. Um, and I'm going to ask you, please, if you've got your testimony, please don't repeat it. We're, we're way beyond our schedule, so understood. Please make your points. And Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, thank you for letting me speak today. And uh, for me, I read this bill last night. I had questions and concerns. I'm here today representing the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. And now, having listened through all the testimony with you, I have even more questions and concerns, but a lot of information has been uh, passed along, especially with respect to one, one question that I had about how easy was it to remove, be removed from the federal NICS system. Sounds like not easy at all. I'm only going to bring up, uh, we'll consider the slippery slope argument to have been made adequately by many other people. Uh, one thing I was listening for in the testimony that I didn't hear was why? Okay, we have a bill that is going to affect a lot of people potentially, but why is it being introduced? Normally we would hear stories of um, what happens. Why do we do this? Um, we have this huge problem and obviously we need a story. Um, Senator Delasky had asked previously if there were a question of another person who provided testimony, if it would save one person, would it be worth it? Frankly, I expected to hear that from the sponsor, the co-sponsor, that gosh, if only Joe had been involuntarily committed, his name supplied to Nick's, he went to a gun store and tried to buy a gun, and he was thrown into jail and he never hurt anyone again, I would at least expect to hear one story. But I don't, and I know that this would not have affected the murders in Connecticut, it would not have affected the murders in Colorado, it would not have affected the murders in Mount Vernon. Oh wait, those weren't committed with a gun. Uh, so, essentially, having heard the testimony I would like to ask the committee to ITL this legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony this morning, sir. Are there any questions from the committee? Thank Seeing okay. none, thank you very much and thank you for sticking around. We appreciate that. Um, the chair will call Penny Dean. Penny Dean is the final speaker here today. 
Um, again, Ms. Dean, I'm going to ask you, we've had a lot of testimony here today, and uh, please do not repeat testimony that we've already heard. If you've got something new to offer, that would be terrific. I think I do. I, I also have something I didn't hear Representative J.R. Hall's name called and he told me. Right, he, he left. I saw that. Oh, wait, he told me that um, he has a memorandum from Attorney Hammond, who's one of his constituents, who wanted it submitted on Representative Hall and Representative, or Attorney Hammond's behalf. So I'm giving That's it fine. to the committee. We, can, we will definitely do that. So please identify yourself for the record. Certainly. Um, my name is Penny Dean. I'm an attorney licensed in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, among other places. And I would ask that you ITL this bad bill. This bill reminds me of a law school exam whereby five felonies and ten torts appear in the first paragraph, and you have to correctly identify them. If the drafters tried to get it all wrong with internally <coughs> inconsistent terms that are inconsistent under state law and federal law, they did a great job. They succeeded. And we haven't even got to the desecration of the Bill of Rights. And I would just note um, for the committee that when big groups come, for example, to the New Hampshire, uh, or rather the National Shooting Sports Foundation, they do not generally represent gun owners in your constituents. I would just remember when they talked about Smith & Wesson being one of their members. Smith & Wesson was one of them that supported the magazine ban in the state. Many gun owners to this day boycast Smith & Wesson because of that. So just, you know, when, when you hear a group or they're a pro-firearm organization, just because they produce firearms and make their living from it, doesn't mean that their actions have been pro-firearm in the past. And I just want to go through, I am looking at the amended bill here, um, not because I presume that's what the committee might be considering now, is the amended bill as opposed to the original bill. And I just note that from the very beginning, the terms are not consistent. When you look at um, 159E1, which is a proposed new section C, or I'm sorry, D rather. They talk about involuntarily committed to a mental health facility. Well, 18 U.S.C. 922 uses the word mental institution. And you ask why would that matter? I'm telling you, any judge that I know is going to say, wait a minute, these are two separate terms, do they mean two separate things? And it's going to cause a lot of confusion and grief. The other thing, and I'm sure it's another drafting error of which there are numerous in this, um, Roman 1C has been appointed a guardian pursuant to RSA 464A. And the way I read that is if you're appointed a guardian, you're on the list now. So I don't want to be anybody's guardian, thank you very much. And I'm sure the drafters intended that the individual appointed a guardian be put on the list. But unfortunately, it's a, it's a case of poor drafting. Um, and when you go on and on and on, throughout the bill, you talk about, particularly in Roman two, the name and address of any mental health provider um, that you've ever had. And here's my concern, is that a lot of people, particularly with mental health problems, have one or two or three or four mental health providers over the years that maybe they didn't get along with and they went their separate way. That mental health provider is now too going to have veto power over them. They're going to be going before the court as a matter of right, as a matter of statute. And I don't think if they've terminated the relationship with them under less than favorable terms that they're going to have good things to say about that person. And I think the court now they're going to be allowed to waive um, patient client privilege, or I'm sorry, patient doctor privilege because it's a matter of statute. They're allowed to bring that information to the court. And I think that's, that's problematic. Um, the other thing is Roman 5, and I'm skipping over numerous errors before that and trying to hit what I call the biggest defects in this horrible, horrible bill, is the petitioner's reputation developed at a minimum through character witnesses, statements, testimony, or other character witnesses. How many people over the years have had a bad neighbor that hates them? You know, and you want that person coming in and saying, you know, you're the craziest person next door, the lady that does whatever, the man that does whatever. Um, Roman 6 is the court shall grant relief um, if they find that he or she will not be likely to act in a manner dangerous to the public safety and the granting of the relief requested would not be contrary to public interest. That's a nebulous statement. In my entire years of practice, I've only seen one doctor willing to write a letter for a patient of his that said this person can have their firearms back and I'm fully confident in their ability, rah, rah, rah. Doctors, malpractice carriers are going to say, are you kidding me? You're going to write these letters for these people? You're going to testify and make a statement like that? They're like, yeah, you no longer have any coverage. It's just not going to happen. 
And lastly, and I think the most important thing that we need to look at here is how this information is going to be treated. This is people's most confidential information. And I can tell you the New Hampshire gun line is better than most, but I don't consider it good. They're, they're, better, than any, they're better than any place else. But here's what we need to look at. Right now, the New Hampshire gun line, in my opinion, I just had a recent case where it was a horrible misuse of information. A person attempted to buy a firearm. The New Hampshire gun line denied them. The person whose basis they denied it on, they were born in a different place, their name was spelled a different way, and a bunch of other things, so how they were the same person is beyond me. But the gun line then took the information pertaining to my client and called the Department of Motor Vehicles. Now, you all are sitting there going, wait a minute, I thought gun line information stayed at gun line and they didn't you know, send it to motor vehicles and other departments. That's what I thought until recently. They absolutely did that. My client got a letter in the mail from DMV saying your license is rescinded because of blah, blah, blah. And it was all because of a mistake at the gun line. And so we went to DMV and said, where'd you get this information? Oh, gun line gave it to us. Think about this. The information that's confidential, you thought that we started under federal law, was never to go anywhere else, is given to the Department of Motor Vehicles. That's just one that I know about. If there's one, I'm telling you there's more. The chances that there's more has to be out there. Now, you need to look at this. You're gonna give this information to the feds. You never can get it back. The feds, when people say you can just appeal next, um, do you wanna give your fingerprints to the feds? If you don't, they won't give you the information despite what the law says unless you wanna sue them in federal court. And so the question is, how is this information being used? When the gun line, who I say is better than NICS and better than other states, still doesn't treat the information as I think it should be treated, as I think the law says it should be treated, and that's the information they have. You're gonna give them more, even more sensitive information? I think we need to make sure the current information is being safeguarded and things are being taken care of before you give them further information. I think you need to look back and say what is happening now and I and I heard this psychiatrist from Dartmouth up here testifying and he was testifying about a lot of law and here's what I would respectfully say to the doctors I don't practice medicine without a license and I don't go into psychiatry and psychology things and he's talking about a lot of provisions of law and terms of law and how they're interpreted and how they work and I don't respectfully believe he was correct as a matter of practice um, Literally, once you have what I call the mark of pain on your head, it's not being taken off. And, and to give this type of information, and we don't have safeguards and guidelines in place, the feds, this is the same group of people that, you know, infants on no fly list. Um, do you want to do that to New Hampshire citizens? You know, I, I respectfully say that, and especially with this piece of legislation, the terms are not consistent. I think that's a huge, huge, huge problem. And they're across the board, they're not even internally consistent. You have to call a coffee cup a coffee cup all throughout. You can't call it a drinking vessel, a cup, and a glass. It, it just becomes problematic when you ask the judge to interpret it and they really try and find the will of the legislature. All right, well, thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon, Ms. Dean. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. I've since received a request. Um, the very last speaker is Janet Grote. If Ms. Grote would please come forward. Please identify yourself for the record. I'm Janet Grote, I live in Portsmouth. And um, I'm speaking today as a mother, uh, as an aunt of a young adult with serious mental illness. And also I'm speaking in a recent volunteer hat that I wear with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense, uh, which has a new, new, ch new chapter here in New Hampshire. I want to thank Senator Waters uh, for this modest and thoughtful attempt to bring some balance to our gun laws. Because it really is all about balance. And as I've listened to the testimony today, I, I'm hearing very much it's about balancing the right to safety for our families and communities with the rights of the mentally ill, the rights of returning veterans, and the rights of anyone that could potentially be compromised as we think seriously about how to put our gun, how to create the kind of gun laws that we need. Um, it's precisely because I think the rights to safety in our communities have been overlooked in the discussion today that I put uh, my name on the list to speak. And thank you for staying here as long as you have. 
Um, I want to talk about what this feels like from a mother's perspective. I live in a compact neighborhood where the houses are close together, next to an individual who suffers from an aggre aggressive form of mental illness. He has threatened my husband. He has threatened our neighbor. He has threatened numerous contractors who have made the mistake of trespassing on his property. I fear for my children every time they play outside. I don't see why an individual like this should have the right to go to a licensed gun dealer in New Hampshire and buy a firearm. I also have a nephew who I mentioned earlier who suffers from a fairly severe case of schizophrenia and he also has developmental disabilities. I love him dearly. I celebrate the small amount of independence he's been able to achieve in his life. I have helped him find work. My husband and I have helped him navigate the stigma that he already encounters by just on the basis of who he is and his behavior on this earth. He struggles and we're with him as much as we can to help him through those struggles. But he's also told me that he hears voices that tell him to hurt his young cousins. There's no reason in my mind that an individual like this should have the right to go to a, a licensed firearm dealer in New Hampshire and buy a firearm. So it's about common sense to me. I recognize the rights. I share the concerns that have been brought forward today about people with disabilities being singled out, about prejudice. But when it comes down to safety in the communities, we really have to think about what's going to make us safe. Um, I know there was a good question or a concern put on the table about data-driven policy. Uh, one of the things I've learned in getting active on this lately is that for years, the federal government was not allowed to collect data on gun violence. So our understanding of what causes it and how it manifests and who's most responsible is somewhat limited. So there isn't the good data that you might want for the perfect policy decision. No, so I ask you to look at the specifics of this bill, not the concerns and the rhetoric about what might happen if these provisions were later expanded someday. You can look at what's already happened in more than 30 states that participate in providing mental health information to the federal background check system, and you can see how it's working there, and that's where you should try to strike for appropriate balance. In terms of looking for a story, um, someone mentioned uh, there are unfortunately always going to be cases of things that fall through the cracks. So this bill isn't going to cover everything. Uh, but I will provide the committee later with a report that I have read. Um, I can give you the link if you'd like. I'll send it to your office about this um, type of fix nix provision. Um, I believe the Virginia Tech shooter was erroneously granted, um, allowed to buy a gun, even though there had been mental health information that should have been reported to the federal background check system. So that may be the story. I'm not here to point out that story. I'm really here to talk about how it feels as a mother and to ask you to look for some balance that will help our communities. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon. Are there any questions from the committee? Sure. Senator Dutton. If you can, while you're sending her the email, can you send a list of all of those other states that have the, uh, the bill already passed in their states? Yeah, I will um, send a link to the report. That's the best way to do it. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing, and the committee will take a five minute break. We will come back together at 1225. So, Thank you.